Hello and welcome to the eighth in our series of sessions on AI, neuroscience and architecture for the doctoral consortium. Uh, this is a platform that we've established for sharing ideas across the globe for doctoral students, um, will be doctoral students uh, and other academic stu um, professors, um, whereby we make available for free um, a series of recordings of lectures um, to be, that are uploaded onto our library. Uh, before I introduce our, um, our guest today, um, it's a great pleasure to have Daniel Bologian here today. Let me just make a few uh, announcements about other sessions this week. It's a very busy week. We have a, our first tutorial in Spanish um, on the 18th uh, of March, uh, which will be the 19th in China. Um, that's followed by a, um, a, 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 a second tutorial in, on, on, generative game, uh, on the generative game uh, with the, the registration link, which you could get if you can do a screen capture right now um, at the bottom there. That's going to be on Saturday uh, in the uh, in, in early morning, um, and uh, uh, on some, on uh, following it on the same day, our first ever session in Portuguese, which will be an extraordinary event um, with uh, Mariana from um, Portugal and other scholars, for other contributors from from Brazil. Um, so it's going to be a very busy week uh, in terms of all, all these events. Um, and please note. The difference in the time. We're now in this kind of in-between moment when um, so we had our we put the clocks forward today um, in the states, um, and in two weeks' time, Europe puts the clocks forward. So over the next few days, uh, next couple of weeks, um, all the times will be changing. Um, so this then is the the eighth in our series. Um, uh, the idea behind the series is to try and um, uh, take a look at what appears to be the new emerging theory of intelligence that's appearing at the intersection between a number of different disciplines, between uh, AI, neuroscience, philosophy, architecture, and so on. And we found, I think, an extraordinary range of uh, contributions so far, all painting the picture of a radically new approach towards how we think through the question about um, what reality is, um, how we engage with the world outside, uh, and so on. Uh, there is something very interesting emerging. Quite how it relates to architectural thinking um, becomes interesting, uh, will become a, something that maybe will evolve over time. But to my mind, this is a very interesting watershed moment when a new set of, of ideas is appear, are appearing, um, uh, a new set of ideas that look set to really change, radically overhaul uh, many of our perceptions about how the human mind operates. And we're looking at how we can rethink some of these questions in the mirror of AI. So today's session follows on from last week's session by Wen Yu Her, looking also at AI and architecture. And uh, we're looking at, we'll also be, um, Daniel will be addressing the question of creativity. Um, next week we have Susan Snyder, also from uh, Florida Atlantic University, um, and then followed by Andy Clark. Uh, we have yet to set the, the, the date for Antonio Damasio, but he will be uh, joining us um, later. Um, so, um, these, all of these uh, um, um, sessions are being uh, recorded and uploaded onto the Digital Futures um, Library, uh, which is the, the link is below, and you can access them all for free. Um, there are quite a few series here. I'm just showing you the architecture and philosophy ones and the yeah, yeah, neuro neuroscience and architecture ones. Um, and you can see that, that we're getting, actually, these are, this is an old shot, um, but there are the, the number of views have been quite extraordinary. So it's turning into a very interesting uh, series of sessions. So um, today I'm, I'm delighted to be able to welcome Daniel Bolojan. Daniel, who's been a, a, a constant um, presence, as it were, in debates about AI and architecture over the last few years, and also a constant presence within the within digital futures itself. Um, Daniel, I should say, is uh, the the uh, is originally from Romania. Um, one of my one of the few contributions that I made is to have given a lecture in Romania once and, and Daniel was in the audience and I don't know quite what I was talking about, but somehow it inspired Daniel to change the path of his career and he moved from um, Ian Minko in, in Bucharest to the famous Angavanta school in Vienna where he studied under Zaha Hadid. Um, he then remained uh, in uh, in Vienna and, and started working for uh, uh, Wolf Pritz at Kopenoblau and became the computational lead on the, the very famous uh, deep Himmelbaum project, which has won awards both at uh, Acadia and the Digital Futures last year. It appears here on the front page, uh, the front cover 
of the AD machine hallucinations of architecture and artificial intelligence book is um, has been guest edited by, my, by myself and Matthias Del Campo that will be coming out at the beginning of June, uh, part of a series of publications on AI and architecture that is just appearing. It's as though we're suddenly entering a new watershed moment. In addition to that, uh, um, uh, Daniel is a, a, an assistant professor at uh, Florida Atlantic University that's rapidly turning into a center for AI and architecture. And he's also um, a, a doctoral candidate uh, at uh, Agavanta, where he's working under Patrick Schumacher, who is also present with us today. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome um, I'd like to welcome Daniel and uh, invite him to um, share his screen. Um, Thank you, Neil. Thank you for the great introduction. Uh, I might say, I have to say that um, that list of uh, invited speakers is very intimidating. So I hope that uh, the presentation today is going to go well. Um, so most of you, you're already familiar with some of my work. So today um, I'm not going to focus so much on um, the progress of the work, but mostly I'm going to try to um, to give a different perspective, let's say to uh, to the work that I've been engaging in uh, for the past like four or five years. Okay, just a second. okay. Okay. Um, so Neil already introduced me, so probably I, I can easily skip this. So I, just to set in a way the base here, just to, to see where I'm coming from with this, um, earlier early on when, uh, when I was still in um, Studio Adit Vienna, my understanding of architecture was very much influenced by system theory, uh, Christopher Alexander and the book Encoding Architecture by Liz Werner, stating that the architect is no longer an organizer of matter and space, but a designer of systems with multi-layered components and complex relationships. So you'll see uh, why uh, later, uh, why that matters. Um, so over the years, my research covered um, areas such as complex systems, agent-based systems as generative uh, model, agent-based systems as agent-based life process simulations, and since 2016, creative AIs. So there are two recurring themes in this research, this idea of encoding intelligence, articulation of design process in which design intention and architectural intelligence are embedded within emergent processes, and creative AI, which explore the potential of teaching machines to interpret, perceive, to be creative. So my first encounter with, with AI um, was basically through a statistical, statistical learning. And uh, mostly it was used to generate predictions for agent-based uh, systems for proximity calculations. And later on, I began uh, experimenting with deep uh, neural networks in order to develop surrogate models for topology optimization. And also in that case, it was mostly to, to try to encode uh, structural uh, logic into agent-based models. Um, and later, like I mentioned before, um, like for the past four or five years, my uh, focus shifted towards creative AIs which explore again the possibility of uh, training machines to interpret, to perceive, and to be creative in order to propose new architectural ideas, enhance design workflows, and augment designer creativity. So the way that I structured this lecture, uh, I structured the lecture in um, four main parts. And like I've mentioned at the beginning, I'm not so much going to focus on the progress of this research, but mostly I'm going to just try to give a different angle. I think the progress will, I'll have to leave it for a different um, lecture. So uh, the first part, mostly I'm just going to try to address a few theoretical aspects. And then in the second part, I'm going to st start to show in a way uh, application of those concepts and uh, the third one, the same and the fourth one. So it's a sort of like, almost like progression kind of uh, way of thinking. So in this presentation, you'll hear uh, me talking about machine intelligence and uh, machine creativity which although it's quite similar perhaps, or could be uh, equ um, in some cases could, could look similar uh, to human intelligence and creativity, we should not confuse them. Um, it should be understood as a sort of limited form of intelligence or creativity. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to make a claim that uh, they are somehow equal. 
So these are a few main topics that I'm going to um, to talk about in, in, uh, in this lecture. So I'm going to talk about architecture as in architecture of the machines and uh, the importance of that architecture. And you will see that this is uh, a part of my research that maybe it was in the background running and I never uh, expressed it like uh, um, in a direct way, but it was always something that uh, it was important, like how do I structure in a way architecture of the networks for specific tasks and so on. And then a another topic will be um, this aspect of machine intelligence, creativity, um, interaction, interconnected, uh, interconnected nodes and so on. And then multimodality when it comes to design and uh, data sets and uh, federated learning, something that uh, currently uh, in Copion Blau we are working on developing. Can a robot turn a canvas into a beautiful masterpiece? Can you? So, um, there's been a major explosion of research, uh, innovative design techniques and experimentation addressing this issue of creativity and artificial intelligence in recent years. And new examples of machines being able to compose songs, paint a painting, write poems, stories, design everyday objects and write uh, uh, movie scripts, they emerge almost like uh, uh, weekly or bi-weekly. So what has changed in recent years to cause such a massive uh, disruption is the volume of data generated on a daily basis, as well as the speed with which computers um, can process data and uncover insights. Uh, when we look at these two examples, uh, so uh, Mario Klingenman and then uh, Microsoft and ING, the new Rembrandt, the next Rembrandt, um, we look at these examples and we can interpret the outcomes perhaps as creative because there is a level of novel novelty involved and there is a level of appreciation of novelty. So that's, it's, uh, that is uh, significant because if something is too novel for us to appreciate, it has no value to us in the end. So if we think about it, both those examples, they could have passed the Turing test, yeah? But are those systems in a way truly intelligent? Are, they, are those machines truly creative? So I'm going to try in a way to, to, throughout this presentation to, to try to tackle in a way here and there in a way, are these machines really intelligent or which is the nature of intelligence that these machines have or what the nature of creativity that they have? So Turing uh, argued in his seminal paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, that we have no way of knowing whether another entity thinks the same way that we do. So the only way we can judge intelligence is by behavior. So Turing proposed that if a computer could uh, converse with a human being so well that we couldn't tell if it was a human or not, then we would be forced to conclude that the computer is intelligent. In doing so, we are holding it to the same standard that we ourselves use. He defined in a way a sort of ba baseline, how we evaluate, how we judge in a way uh, the performance of the machine. So when I'm conversing with a human, I'm unaware of the process that his or her brain is going through in order to produce an intelligent response. However, I can assess the response based on its behavior because your behavior is comparable to mine. I must accept that you are in intelligent as well. Um, so Turing also raised uh, the following question, can a machine be allowed to carry out something that can be described as thinking, but which is very different from what humans do? So if we are looking uh, at computer science, first computer scientists, when they attempt to teach computers to see, they assume that computers will see in the same way that humans do. Of course, later on, they realize that when recognizing numbers, machines actually identify numbers based on pixel relations, yeah? So they are looking at pixels, values, and relations between those uh, pixels, and that's how they understand, you know, in numbers. So it's very different from the way that we humans uh, do. So very often we are getting stuck in these kind of questions, like, is it possible for a machine to be, to see the same way that humans do? Um, and in my opinion, that's kind of a irrelevant question, because again, can, can a machine be allowed um, to perform something that can be described as seeing, but is very different from the way that humans see. Uh, so Turing also uh, addresses this aspect of 
We do not wish to penalize the machine for its inability to shine in beauty competitions, nor to penalize the man for losing in a race against a uh, airplane. So I think it's always, uh, when, when we try to answer this kind of question, is this intelligent or is it creative? We have to really have a, a baseline in a way to understand what we are referring to. Because in many cases, something is creative, but it has, it's, at, it's at a very low level not at a different level, yeah? So depending how we are looking at it, it might be that in some cases, yes, it's crazy, others not. So in my opinion, Turing, he was a genius and I'm just going to <laughs> go a bit over some of his work and to, to, uh, to, to show you why. Uh, so I think his ideas were way ahead of his time. Um, so in 1948, for example, in his paper, Intelligent Machinery, he introduced a variety of machinery models or machines models that are still at the core of our modern computers today. As we will see, the arch architecture, the structure of the machine can offer new opportunities uh, for degrees of intelligence to, develop, uh, to be developed or not. So here, these are a few examples of, of these kind of uh, machines that uh, he proposed. So some of the models include logical computing machines, unorganized machines, and modifiable and self-modifying machine. So these models are also at the core of what we define today as expert systems and learning systems. On the left, we have the logical mathematical models, and on the right, we have the unorganized machines, which are basically neural nets. And this was modeled based on how brain works, at least based on their understanding that they had in 1940. Uh, so once again, on the left, we have an example of an expert system. On the right, we have an example of a learning system. So it's interesting to observe the different types of network architecture that leads to different performance of these machines. So without taking necessarily a detour into uh, if machines can be conscious, um, this argument of uh, the network architecture, it's also an argument that um, um, Manuel Bloom and Lenore Bloom are making also in their uh, conscious Turing machine research. Um, today, we don't have machines with proper architecture that will allow a machine to have a basic level of, of consciousness. So pretty much this is what they are trying to prove that they can have a base model in a way to prove in a way that the machine can be conscious and just by changing the architecture of, of things. So let's, let's go and see what, what exactly we mean by expert systems versus learning systems. Uh, so I believe that one of the most significant shifts that we are uh, witnessing today is a shift from expert system to learning system. Um, so this is very evident in computer science, uh, probably also in architecture, we are going to start to feel it uh, more and more in many other fields. So it's also interesting here to, to point out that um, that kind of split that we had when it comes to machines, this type of machine, uh, many of you, you are familiar with the, with the term um, AI winter. So what happened is that um, neuroscientists, they decided to go with the expert system with the logical computing machines, and they, uh, they were not very interested in unorganized machines. And then we had like a few years, like tens of years, like when, uh, when uh, this side, like organized machines, like neural nets were not, uh, not developed. And then uh, in 2006, um, deep learning started to gain uh, power again. And um, now we have the deep learning that it's more dominant in a way than expert systems. So um, what's an expert system? So expert systems were very popular in the 90s, 70s and 80s, while learning systems, they became popular around 2006. Yeah? So that was the AI winter. Uh, so an expert system, uh, it's a, it's a knowledge-based system composed of two subsystems, a knowledge base, which specifies rules, and an inference engine, which applies the rules to known facts to derive new facts. So a learning system, on the other hand, are systems based on neural networks that derive solutions from raw data. So an expert system, it's based on logic systems, which feature hard-coded solutions, and they require a human expert to input information into the knowledge base. Uh, on the other hand, learning systems, rather than relying on harder, hard-coded solutions, they learn by example. They learn solutions from first principles. So in that sense, expert systems are unable to generalize due to these differences, and they are limited to pre-programmed solutions, making them unable to have solutions to unforeseen solution conditions. So learning systems, on the other hand, can generalize 
and offer solutions to new conditions. Expert systems are great when we use them to solve sequential problems with finite steps, while learning systems are most effective when we, uh, we use them to find new insights that you may not even know about when you have a significant amount of uncertainty in your problem. So what do we mean by a system's ability to generalize? So um, Lecun, which is uh, the father actually of CNNs, of a convolutional neural network, um, this defines it as one of the most important features of a learning machine is uh, the generalization performance. So generalization determines in terms of computer science uh, language, uh, determines the amount of data needed to train the system such that a correct response is produced when presented a pattern outside of the training set. The opposite of generalization, it's overfitting, which means memorization. Um, so uh, another definition of from uh, psychology, generalization is observed when learners engage in the skills we teach them in untrained but similar conditions. So it's very similar like uh, with, with this kind of analogy of you're teaching something in a classroom and then during the exam, you're uh, giving completely new scenarios in the exam and the student, they have to prove that they understood the main concepts that were, uh, were taught in class. They are able to apply them on the new um, scenarios that they are presented with in, uh, in that, during the exam. So in that way, a student that is able to, to take the principles from the class and apply them to new uh, scenarios from the exam, that student, we, we assume that that student actually learned, was able to generalize in a way the knowledge that was presented to him. So the same way it happens also with machines that So examples of um, expert systems and learning systems. One example of expert system is um, Deep Blue. And one example of learning system is uh, AlphaGo. So nothing in the knowledge base of Deep Blue will help it do anything else besides playing chess. To play another game, it will have to be reprogrammed. So Deep Blue, in that sense, it's a hard-coded specialized system with hard-coded rules that is good at one thing, playing chess. In terms of thinking about intelligence, something was missing there, the notion of learning and the notion of generalization. What are missing from Deep Blue and expert systems in general? So is this machine intelligence, is hard-coded knowledge machine intelligence? Does following rule constitute machine intelligence? AlphaGo, on the other hand, is an example of learning system. So Go is primarily a game about intuition rather than calculation, which is more dominant in games like chess. So uh, that's how Go professionals, players, deal with uh, enormous complexity and uh, this evaluation function. Uh, they rely on their instincts and their intuition to navigate in a way that kind of complexity of the game. So AlphaGo as a system is designed by having um, uh, a structure composed by three networks that interact. So you have on one hand, a policy network, a value network, and a tree search, a Monte Carlo search tree. So one side value network provides an estimate of the value of the current state at, of the game. Uh, on the other side, the policy network provides guidance regarding which action to choose given the current state of the game. So the result is a probability value for each possible leg legal move where uh, higher probability values correspond to actions that have a higher chance of leading to a win. So the team network, they are con constantly learning by playing a game uh, against themselves. And the last component is the tree search um, the Monte Carlo tree search algorithm, which looks through different variations of the game and tries to define which move is most likely to succeed. So in terms of thinking about intelligence, the notion of learning and the notion of generalization, although it's still domain specific in a way kind of generalization can be observed in AlphaGo, yeah? And what I mean by domain specific is that uh, probably if you, if, you have, if you ask AlphaGo to play another game that, uh, than Go, probably it's not going to be able to do that but it's still able to generalize, it's still able to, uh, to react to new um, conditions that was not trained with. 
So um, this this uh, question it's always uh, leveraged uh, against um, this kind of networks. Um, this kind of claim that they are mostly using a brute force. Uh, so I will agree with uh, this argument of deep uh, of uh, brute force when it comes to deep blue, because deep blue uh, as a specialized system it's able to to really analyze 200 million moves per second or five or 50 billion positions in three minutes uh, allotted for a single move in a chess game. So in that sense, it's really like just looking through the lookup table and finding in a way that the right in a way combination, the right, the right solution. And in the case of AlphaGo, um, AlphaGo, you, you can take all computers in the world and try to run all of them and you're still not going to be able to, uh, to figure out all the potential moves that you have in Go. So in that sense, already this idea of brute force is a bit kind of eliminated, yeah? So AlphaGo is not a brute force in my opinion, because the, the, final, lear uh, the final learning is not a step-by-step -step process and it's not uh, solved by exploring all possible neural networks uh, weights. So rather it's, a, it's, um, it's solved from an optimization standpoint which aids in the discovery of optimal weights via gradient descent. So here, just a, a very brief example. Um, I think in one lecture, I, I was uh, spending a bit uh, of time on um, building up a tic-tac-toe in our game and step-by-step, step. but a very simplified version of that will be um, on, on the uh, left side, you have a very simple in a way model where you basically just have a function of a lookup table where you put in all the potential combination moves on, on the board. And then you have another function, which is mostly uh, able to look at that lookup table, look at the position of the board and decide which uh, move has to be made. Yeah? Uh, and on the uh, right side, you have something uh, which is a bit more sophisticated, which is uh, you have a machine that has to, or you have a function that first has to understand the game so uh, has to understand the sort of representation of the game. Then you have to understand which is the position uh, on the board, which are the next uh, permissible or legal in a way moves. And then you have a valuation function. So the idea or difference between these two systems uh, is that one of them it's uh, static, it's specific, the rules are uh, clearly stated and they're explicit. While in the other case, the, the right side, you have uh, a system that is dynamic, is generic, and it's implicit. So as designers, we, we engage, if we engage with this kind of neural networks, let's say um, GANs or other kind of neural networks, um, I think we, we start to be convinced that somehow we are moving away from um, um, expert systems you know, like uh, rule-based or, or this kind of systems that we have um, or other kinds of computational tools that are rule-based. We have this kind of GAN architecture, deep architecture, uh, what we feed, um, we feed them with hundreds and thousands of uh, examples, architecture examples, and this deep architecture can learn the representation of the data that we present them with, yeah? Uh, but the question here is, is our model actually generalizing well? Uh, so what's happening if our model doesn't generalize? What's happening when your model is overfitting or memorizing the data put in simpler term? Uh, so if your model is overfitting, it means that we are back in the Chinese room. So for those of you that don't know, uh, Chinese room problem uh, is this kind of idea where um, just following a sort of dictionary and a sort of rule how to translate things doesn't constitute necessarily that you know Chinese or Mandarin actually. Um, so the same happens also here. When you memorize, you don't actually understand the, the base concepts that are in that, um, in that um, body of knowledge, let's say. Um, so in this case, uh, when we talk about design architecture, that would be actually a very bad thing because probably then we just uh, conserve history. We are just repeating history. We are not learning anything probably from that. Um, so it might be that some designers will make this argument that uh, when working with, on creative tasks, the issue of overfitting or underfitting is not that concerning as a value, as value can be found in artifact generated by a badly trained network. So for me, that sounds great and I have no problem with that, uh, but uh, there is still a question that bothers me. Uh, so for me, it's great that you want to find a way a novelty in these kind of very strange outcomes, but 
my question is why do you need a neural network for that? Yeah. Um, why not use just a blender, for example? Because in the end, the blender, how, how is that different from a blender? You just throw thousands of images in the blender, spin it up, something that's interesting comes out and you have in a way an interesting artifact, yeah? Um, so a machine that overfades, in my opinion, is no creative, is not, not intelligent, is no more intelligent than a blender is, yeah? That simply spins whatever you put in. So we are used, of course, to hunt for this kind of artifact that uh, different technologies we engage with uh, will generate in this quest to find um, this kind of novel solution. But I believe to surrender to that kind of mode of operation is to negate the learning system potential, uh, to reduce the learning system to some generators that might create some artifacts, what uh, we might consider novel. It's a big misuse uh, of, of the technology's potential, in my opinion. So just briefly, um, to touch a bit on this idea of creativity. And all these, all these topics are very, very uh, big topics and um, they are black holes in a way, like um, it's, it's very hard to define in a way objectively what uh, intelligence is and what uh, creativity is, especially when it comes to machines. So although AI can uh, exhibit some form or a kind of intelligence and some form of creativity, it should, not, it should not be equated with human creativity or intelligence. So what is creativity? If we think about ancient cultures, they lacked our current concept of creativity. They consider creativity a form of discovery. So the rejection of creativity in favor of discovery dominated the West until the Renaissance. Uh, by the uh, 18th century, the term creativity had become increasingly uh, associated with the concept of imagination. And in the late uh, 19th century, theories such as um, Helmholtz and uh, Poincaré began, began to reflect and publish their creative processes pioneering the scientific study of creati creativity. So although the scientific study of creativity produced many theories, models, and uh, systems throughout the 20th century, um, defining creativity in objective terms was and still is very challenging. So uh, Margaret Bowden, which is a cognitive science, uh, science uh, researcher whose main uh, uh, research actually focuses on creativity and AI, identifies three types of uh, creativity. So in her opinion, uh, she believes that these are two main types like uh, combinational, um, exploratory, transformational. So combinational creativity produces unfamiliar combinations of familiar ideas, and it works by making associations between ideas that were previously only indirectly linked. While exploratory um, creativity rests on some culturally accepted style of thinking or conceptual space, this may be a style of a painting or music, the space is defined and constrained by a set of generative rules. Every structure produced by following them will fit the style concerned. In exploration, expl in exploratory creativity, the person moves throughout the space, exploring it to find out what there, uh, what's there, to discover both the potential and the limits of the space in question. In transformational creativity, the space or style itself is transformed by alt altering or dropping one or more of its defining dimensions. Ideas can all be generated that simply could not have been generated before the change. So from a perspective of machine creativity, and I think a more, more um, up to date kind of uh, definition is uh, the definition um, that Demi Sasabi is um, uh, the founder of um, DeepMind, if I, uh, yeah, I remember. I, I completely forgot now. Uh, I'm blanking out on that name. <clears throat> so yeah, the, the creator of Deep, Deep Mind, he identifies these three types of creativity, which I believe are a bit more up to date. And I think they're also an interesting frame in a way to, to look at things, yeah? So one of them is interpolative, extrapolative, and inventive. So neural networks are very good or pretty good actually at interpolations. They are these massive statistical machines and they are very good at averaging things out, spotting patterns in data 
And as designers, we often engage perhaps in a very similar model of operation, uh, interpolative model of creativity, where we create uh, or construct interpolations of previously, previously known ideas. And I think this happens also at multiple levels. Like if you have your own repertoire, probably it's a sort of interpolation that you have within that repertoire. Um, if you talk about like larger in a way uh, ideas, like cultural ideas, you interpolate within that kind of culture that you are in. And those ideas, in a way, start to be interpolated. Uh, neural networks uh, are not that good at extrapolation. Uh, there are just a few networks that uh, have a degree, let's say, of extrapolation, but they're not that good. So extrapolation, um, so if you're looking here, you see uh, the first example, you have the white dots representing, in a way, the data set. And just by averaging things out, you end up with a new sample that is new, which is just an averaging uh, interpolation of all the others. So you can create, you can imagine, you can create like thousands and thousands of this kind of interpolation, which is a interesting thing because you might wonder then what is creativity? If it's so easy to create this kind of uh, variations that maybe are, are quite interesting as well. Uh, so extrapolative creativity will be um, a machine that is able to, to generate new samples that are outside the data set outside of the uh, examples that were presented in a data set. An invention, which is a, the third, a third type, will be inventing uh, the game of Go uh, or a new game, which at this moment we don't have any machine capable of something like that. So of course, other things that are missing from a machine creativity, uh, although the, uh, these kind of neural networks are pretty successful thus far, there are actually a bunch of things that they they uh, still need to work on and uh, they're not really that good at. Uh, for example, things like concepts, abstractions or abstract thinking, analogies or reasoning by analogy, memory systems, imagination. Although imagination, uh, there is a query network right now that are trying in a way to, um, to, to solve that or to attack that, that angle. So also we have to look at these examples as isolated networks. There is limited or no interaction with external stimuli. So always here, we, we have to factor that in. So we hear a lot about artistic creativity, but think about creativity in other domains, such as scientific creativity, which produces beautiful new theories in mathematics or physics. So it's unclear to me, once you get into these formal domains, to what extent what we call today creativity is not a form of meaningful random search and basically structuring how we search for the right things. Certain people have a talent to shape in which direction they are searching for new things. When you talk to a digital composer, for example, you'll notice that they, they begin with some random string of, uh, of a, a instrument or something, which later then they start to enhance and manipulate until a, a, a melody emerges. It's almost like they are shaping or warping in a way the search space. So can we use an AI to augment how we conduct meaningful random search and design explorations? This idea, it's also shared by, by uh, Costas, uh, where he's saying AI establishes um, what AI establishes above all else is that every possible form, it's already out there. And it's simply a matter of searching for it. Also Neil, it's is making the same argument. It's merely a question of conducting the right search. It's not about the designer inventing some new proposal by drawing upon his her genius, but rather of selecting the best solution from a range of existing possible options. So, what use does it have to engage then with these very, very sophisticated learning machines when in the end, the results are evaluated by a human being? And here, I hope that I'm not going coming across as being against humans. Um, I'm just raising the question here. All these outcomes will be constrained by our, own, by our own limitations. We are often unaware when we are trapped into a design local minima, for example. So without a question, the human agent plays an important role in the process. Uh, but what we consider to be creative is very often something very conventional. We have a constructed way of seeing the world around us, 
as articulated also by Derrida, that limits how we evaluate certain things. We have a very limited range of what we can imagine. So everything we hear, see, or read makes sense for us in the context of what we know. People evaluate these outputs based on things that they already know, they are familiar with, and when they are faced with what is unknown to them, they might think that those things are new, but what is new? For some, it's brand new, while for others, it's not, perhaps, yeah? So if something is too novel, we can't appreciate it. If it's too unexpected and too unrelatable, we can appreciate it. If it's too similar to what we know, we still don't appreciate it. But there is this sweet pot where, where you have this kind of like balance between these, these two. Ideas that we appreciate as creative have a blend of familiarity and novelty. All ideas reach a point of, of uh, overexposure where they become cliche and they start to lose popularity and downfall into until they grow out of date. We are going to go uh, come back to this uh, a bit later in the presentation. So while developments in AI mean computers can be trained on certain creativity uh, criteria, the degree to which AI can develop its own sense of creativity is still something to inquire about. Can AI be taught without guidance how to create? Can AI be taught how to interpret things? Can AI be taught how to re in, reinterpret representations from one domain to another, like how architects are inspired from concepts outside of their architectural domain and then translate those ideas into architectural domain. Teaching computers to be creative, it's inherently different from how people create, but we don't yet know much about our own creative methodology. We become what we, beho what we behold. We shape our tools and then our tools shape us. So here I'm going to start to, to approach in a way this kind of idea of interaction, how, we, how the networks are interacting um, with other networks versus with, uh, with people. So just going over this idea of way of seeing by John Berger, um, seeing comes before words. The child look, uh, looks at recognizing, looks and recognizes before it can speak. But there is also another sense in which seeing comes before words. It is seeing which establishes our place in the surrounding world. We explain that world with words, but words can never undo the fact that we are surrounded by it. The relation between what we see and what we know is never settled. And then, um, René Magritte um, commented on this always present gap between words and seeing. The way we see things is affected by what we know or what we see. In the Middle Ages, when a man believed in a physical uh, existence of hell, the sight of fire must have meant something different to what it means today. So if you look also at other, in a way, um, uh, ideas, for example, uh, Alan Turing, uh, when talking about uh, how to uh, to teach machines, um, he was pointing out that it will be unfair to expect the machine straight from the factory to compete on equal terms with an on university um, graduate. The graduate has had um, contact with human beings for 20 years or more. This contact has been modifying his behavior pattern throughout the period th throughout that period. His teachers have been intentionally trying to modify it. At the end of the period, a large number of standard routines will have been super, superimposed on the original pattern of his brain. Th those uh, routines will be known to the community as a whole. He is then in a position to try out new combinations of these routines to make slight variations of them and then apply them in new ways. So most of the machines that we have right now, they are based on this kind of optimization like the loss function in a way. So here questions are, which are the goals that you try to optimize towards when you work with neural networks? Uh, is optimization the correct approach? And is optimization enough? So a, a question there will be, which is the optimization goal or the loss function for art. For example, you want to train a network um, to create art. 
which is the loss, fun loss function for that, which is the optimization goal, which is the optimization goal for a qualitative criteria, for example, which is the optimization goal loss function for design. But that's, that's a problem there. Yeah? Design is not, an, uh, it's not optimization towards a certain goal. Design, in, it's a negotiation between multiple competing goals. Design, it's a negotiation between qualitative and quantitative criteria. So current models have demonstrated this ability to win games and to outperform humans in tasks that can be broken down into something that can be scored, measured. But large parts of our life is not about, or a large part of our life is not about winning. It's not about, it's mostly about adaptation. It's about negotiation rather than just winning a game. So we can easily say that um, if a problem can be um, broken down into, um, into parts that can be measured, then we can have a, an AI, a network that actually is able to output the um, loss function of that, that problem. Uh, but there are a lot, a lot of um, aspects in this world that cannot be broken down and you cannot assign a loss function to them. So here we have a typical network. It's a uh, autoencoder uh, that ha has this kind of um, loss function, yeah? mapping the input to output and trying to minimize in a way that kind of distance between input and output. So um, if we train a neural network like, uh, like um, autoencoder to look at satellite images and translate them into a map view, we can simply train this kind of autoencoder to translate an image and then compare the translated photo into uh, its actual pair. So the autoencoder will use some convolution blocks, downsampling the image a few times, then upsample a few times to return the image to its initial size. The reason for downsampling and upsampling is to compress features which might be far apart spatially but are related in the image. So the network pretty much is trying to figure out the relation between input and output, yeah? And by realizing that relation, it's minimizing in a way that kind of um, um, distance or loss function. So after a few epochs, we can, uh, if we um, plot out the gradient descent uh, of, of that specific network, we can easily see that it's converging, yeah? But like I mentioned, um, this, this kind of um, approaches, yes, they, they, they might, um, um, we might, might, be, uh, might be using this kind of network to solve certain problems that can be easily described and uh, uh, are easily quantifiable. But even, even if it's uh, that, uh, if, even if that's the case, uh, it's not really that easy. So if we are looking at, at this aspect of um, a very trivial, you'll say, um, task, of ranking um, news feeds, yeah? So these days, um, we all know uh, the polarization that we, uh, we are living in, in terms of uh, politics and other kind of uh, topics. And uh, pretty much that's a sort of loss function. It's an algorithm that tries to, to uh, maximize engagement, let's say, on a news feed, yeah? And you might wonder like, well, that's a very trivial in a way, a very easy task how to rank and how to, uh, to encourage uh, in engagement on this kind of news feeds. And in the end, you see the, the, uh, the ripple effect in a way that they have, let's say, on overall society. So sometimes in a way, those kind of methods, even if they are simple, like we, we have to be aware, be careful in a way how, how we approach those. And I think um, it's always good to, to try to just deep your, uh, your finger in the water and then slowly test in a way how things work and then um, keep on developing things rather than um, trying to boil the entire ocean at once. Yeah, is that expression like um, in startup trying to boil the ocean when in fact you have to start with one um, coffee cup or something. Yeah. So here again, we have this idea of two networks. So at the moment, uh, one classifier, one autoencoder. So these networks, they are isolated. They are not communicating with each other. So if that's the case, then you end up with, with something that pretty much looks like this. So you have two separate networks that they have their own goals. They might be com competing goals, but uh, they have their own goals like uh, optimization goals and uh, 
then they, they start to converge towards that goal. But if we start to, to um, if we start to connect them, to allow them to interact, suddenly we, we start to have something, something that looks like this. So this one is not anymore, is not anymore a optimization. When you look at this, this is not optimization anymore. Um, so um, this is what we know today as GANs, yeah? So you have two types of networks, a um, generator, which is the autoencoder, and a classifier, which is the uh, discriminator. And both networks, they have competing goals, yeah? One a network has the goal of creating fake images, and the other has a goal to identify the fake images. So it's this kind of adversarial, adversarial game in a way that they are playing, that in a way, the network has to find a sort of equilibrium, like Nash equilibrium, for example, where they have to, uh, in a way, ha you have two competing goals, and it's a sort of negotiation that takes place in a way in that kind of network, yeah? So this idea, like, um, uh, was recently, recently 2017, uh, a, a very nice in a way paper about, about this idea of GANs and how they mostly almost like represent sort of um, the simplest in a way society, like two players and how they engage in this kind of dynamic in a way process. So if before you had those kind of networks that are mostly just static, just by themselves, now you have a very limited population where you have two agents in a way, um, you know, interacting. So I'm going to, um, to to start to show a few ideas. And here, um, all the time, what I'm doing uh, in these kind of projects, I'm, I'm trying to to understand which is the kind of architecture of a um, of a machine that can be creative. Yeah. So you'll see there are a lot of processes, a lot of steps, uh, which uh, mostly I'm engaging in this kind of research with uh, with uh, my students. And we are trying to figure out like which are relevant parts in the design process that perhaps uh, later then can be converted into an actual network that will have in a way disabilities. So agent-based creative AI project uh, um, methodology consists of a holistic approach to design processes in which a variety of interconnected neural networks strategies coupled with agent-based systems are deployed to address different architecture and design tasks. This methodology develops on system theory that sees architecture as a system comprised of and working with a series of inter interrelated systems. Neuroscientists have identified several approaches for assessing creativity, uh, focusing on the person, the product, and the process. The project takes a process approach to establishing qualitative benchmarks for, for increasing design creativity, as valuing the logistic of overall method is more beneficial than a discrete examination of the outcomes. So this, this kind of research, uh, we are actually um, um, engaging the, the three of us, Shermin Manos, um, uh, Shermin Yusuf, uh, Professor uh, Manos Vermiso, and myself. We're engaging in a way this kind of process where we are trying to understand in a way, or we are trying to look at uh, we are trying to look at design as this kind of multi-layer in a way process, where um, uh, when when engaging with neural networks, that's actually what you're doing. You're interrogating in a way design processes and then try to understand which kind of network, which kind of process has to be applied for, for that kind of uh, uh, design process. So in this paper that is going to be uh, uh, soon presented, um, is language all we need? We are interrogating this aspect of uh, language models and we are proposing actually a sort of workflow uh, that actually um, might work better. So one of the challenges with this AI model is that they are domain specific systems. Um, so when using architectural design as discrete system to address multiple architectural systems or tasks, they tend to flatten relations between architectural systems. This is rather problematic as the outcomes of the architecture process is codependent on multiple interrelated systems. We want AI models to be aware of the variety of correlations between architectural systems. So the, the importance of a sound process within a non-exclusively human workflows has been previously advocated by um, Eric Asparov. 
According to Kasparov, the limitation in current AI workflows can be assess, uh, assisted with calibrating the relation between human and artificial element in the process. He observed that a weak human player plus a machine plus a better process is superior to very powerful machine alone, and more surprisingly, superior to a strong human player plus machine and an inferior process. The goal here is that of creativity and intelligence amplification to use information technology as a tool to enhance human decision instead of replacing them with autonomous AI systems. So here, one, one example of that kind of process that I was mentioning before, um, really different kinds of processes, what kind of network, what kind of functions they need to have in order to, at the end, to arrive at a sort of a machine that is creative. So here, the project is divided in three main parts, exploration, qualify, and generate. And as you can see, every single uh, step design uh, process and step in a way, it's integrated and uh, we are asking, okay, what kind of network, what kind of process we can engage in here or we can propose here for this specific design task. So aspects are also meant mostly just automate, uh, automating things. So when it comes to structural performance, for example, if we want to help, uh, embed structural performance into this kind of uh, logics, then uh, we just um, create some surrogate models that are able, for example, in this case, topology optimization, it's able to learn and give uh, accurate predictions of uh, topology optimization that I, then later we can use them as real time in a way um, simulations. And the process, I'm just going to go faster through this, but here we are, we are doing exactly that idea that I was saying. We, I'm trying to figure out in a way, which are the main components required for a creative machine, for example. And we are just going down to uh, and interrogating in a way all these kind of design processes. But the same also aspect of, okay, if we can um, evaluate certain things, um, what kind of uh, criteria we use, qualitative, quantitative criteria, which of those criteria can be uh, quantified and which can be measured. And here we start in a way to develop different, different ways of, of um, analyzing this kind of like strands in a way generated by the agent-based systems. Because one of the problems with agent-based systems, um, they, they tend to, to be very complex and very hard to evaluate. Um, so in this case, we uh, actually developed a um, machine vision in a way, a tool that just looks at whatever perspective of, of an agent-based uh, agent system result, and then it's able to, to give in a way evaluations towards like uh, how bundled certain things are, like um, how dense it is, do you have a lot of sparse in a way, uh, strands or not, yeah? So here my focus is not so much on, on the, the geometrical system as much I'm interested in um, the actual um, architecture of, of the, the kind of machine that um, I envision building in the end when it comes to creative uh, machines. And we are also, of course, uh, engaging with uh, 3D networks that, um, yeah, 3D networks um, that uh, per I personally de uh, de uh, developed this network. Uh, it's uh, one of the first like, um, style-based style 3D networks. And here, the same kind of question uh, remains, like once you have a 3D object now, not just strands, there are different qualities in a way that you might look for. And um, then we have like this kind of uh, machine vision kind of uh, algorithms that helps us to, uh, to evaluate and analyze and sort and uh, evaluate things. So um, Gaudi and our networks project, uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, I'm not going to show any uh, new progress of this. I'm going to show probably uh, the progress uh, on these projects uh, in, a, in a separate presentation. Uh, but here I just wanna show in a way, um, again, this idea of the architecture of the network, uh, the architecture of the machine and the importance that that architecture has, yeah? So uh, this ongoing research is looking at the development of neural networks capable of uh, 
identifying relevant compositional features in samples representing Antoni uh, Gaudi Sagra Familia and samples from nature. So you can say that there are uh, relevant tectonic uh, or the relevant tectonics that are defined in Sagrada Familia that are very constrained in a way by, by this kind of very symmetrical in a way composition that uh, the Basilica has at this point. So the goal here is to, to deploy these kind of strategies and to extract in a way, learn something, extract in a way meaningful information, and then liberate perhaps this, this uh, intricacy that you can find in, uh, in that tectonic detail of, of, uh, of the Sagrada Familia and then uh, maybe play out this complexity on, on more, more complex layouts. So here are just a few results of that. So when it comes to um, training data, we can see that process as a sort of humans transferring their knowledge and reasoning, leaving inside the brain into the machine. Um, now, just be careful there because uh, when it comes to, to data sets, um, data sets, they are a very limited form of uh, agency, I'll say, like how we as humans encode intention, let's say. So here, one question is always when we work with networks is, are we merely preserving established solutions or are we looking for something that can generate solutions outside the confines of the given domain and thus broaden our understanding. So in here, um, I'm just showing this example of this is mostly interpolation. So you have machines that are able to look at, at samples of Sagrada Familia and it are able to create this kind of coherent interpolations, which uh, it's meant to, to show that the machine actually was able to learn the representation and it's able now to create this kind of smooth interpolations between different, uh, different uh, samples, yeah. But in that instance, yeah, we are mostly dealing then with, we are just preserving the, the past, we are just conserving it, and we are just repeating the same kind of ideas. Uh, to move away from this kind of mere, mere interpolation mode, uh, three, three, uh, three strategies were developed. One, uh, addressing the machine perception and designing the feature maps that allow the network to identify relevant architectural features. So here, um, one of those aspects, it's here, like how you fine tune those kind of feature maps. And uh, this is something that also we as humans, we have a certain filter that we use or, um, yeah, we have a sort of filter that we use when, when we look uh, in, the, in the real world. A second strategy um, implements pro uh, pro progressive training that allows for a better disentanglement of features. Um, and this allows for particular features to be isolated and controlled at any given layer. And a third strategy um, uses a, a node-based system with six interconnected networks to provide access to various compositional scales. Um, these strategies, mechanisms, and methodologies enable the encoding of design intention and intelligence at multiple levels of design. So just to explain it a bit from this kind of perspective of networks interacting. So in this case, uh, is not anymore an optimization kind of process that is happening here. So you see, you have multiple networks that are interacting with each other. So you have the, the first network that you see here that locally it's interacting with a auto encoder and a classifier. And then in the middle, we have a, a separate kind of network that locally interacts auto encoder classifier. And then uh, the, the bottom one, the same, yeah? So you have this kind of like um, local, global, you know, a kind of types of interactions that actually um, the networks then they're they're engaging in a sort of negotiation of certain features and certain uh, certain um, uh, design in a way, uh, particular design features that that um, uh, the project has and um, uh, the other domains that they are paired with. And just to give an example then of of uh, how. Um, how the gradient uh, descent in a way looks um, for this kind of network. So you see you have locally, uh, just in the, in the left side, you have mostly two networks that are kind of isolated and they compute uh, their optimization in a way kind of uh, 
uh, algorithms or um, yes, optimization without any interaction with other networks. And then all the other networks, mostly they, they interact. They have this kind of like um, adversarial kind of a relation with the other networks where one network tries to push in one direction, the other network tries to uh, push the other direction. And in the end, the entire system, it's this, this very, very big elaborated in a way um, system. So interpretive abilities are featured by networks one, two, three, and five, while limited extrapolative abilities are featured by network four and six. Network one, it's learning the representation of low level compositional features, while network two performs text-based queries to enable a more strategic search of the lower level latent space and provide mechanism for encoding design intentions. Network three is learning the representation of the non-architectural domain from which high level features will be transferred, while network five is learning the representations of architectural domain, in this case, Sacral Familia. The latent space of the two network three and five serve as the input data for uh, network six, which is responsible for transferring across the domains represented by network three and five. Yeah, so here you really have networks. It's almost you have a network that's connected to the memory, the brain of the other network, where you have the latent space of of those networks. Uh, because network four is generated. Um, by retaining the low level structure of the network one and blending it with the high level features of uh, network three, its output samples inherit low and high level features from both network one and three. So this is a network four, for example, yeah, where you have this kind of combinations of low and high in a way features. So for me, this, this kind of system comes closer to a system that um, can resemble a system that is creative more than systems that are solely in a way um, oriented towards this kind of optimization kind of goals, yeah? Because again, how do you define the optimization goal for a creative task, for example? Okay, I'm just going to skip uh, over this. We are already quite um, okay. So um, DPM Blau, I'm going to again also DPM Blau. I'm going to try to to talk about DPM Blau from this perspective of the network architecture, the importance of having networks interacting, uh, and so on. Yeah. So um, so uh, for those of you that don't know, um, DPM Blau it's a um, research project undertaken by uh, by DPM Blau which operates at the intersection between architecture practice and uh, AI deep learning. Um, and what we are trying to do here, we are trying to, to teach machines in a way to be creative, to look at, at uh, samples from our office, learn some insights from, from those samples and then uh, propose new, um, new ideas. Uh, so here we are not interested necessarily in um, uh, automating, let's say design. We are interested in uh, augmenting design. And uh, you'll see um, what I'm going to show next. That you'll see that how we, we avoid, in a way, just simply automating design. So we have three main er uh, areas that we are uh, operating, operating with this network. So uh, um, the most well-known parts are the Gestalt one, because uh, those are the most um, interesting to show in uh, presentations, let's say. So Gestalt. Uh, that's mostly the, the one that most of you know. Uh, organization, um, not that much, but organization referring to um, programmer or, uh, or organization, uh, messing, and these kind of topics. And technical, which mostly uh, refers to surface rationalization, uh, panelization, and um, those kind of topics, almost like optimization. So DPM Blau as a, as a style, it's quite, quite diverse. Um, so this, this is an example of uh, some um, um, massing models that are generated by DPM Blau by simply like we have, as, as we are an office uh, of, um, with 50 years experience in practice, we have something like 950, if not more projects. Uh, and we have all those projects, we have um, 3D sketches, 
images, renders, and all that. Yeah. Uh, so in that regard, then uh, any kind of domain that we are operating in and any kind of mode that we are operating in, we have um, quite quite a vast data set for that. We're also approach, uh, addressing aspects of um, environmental performance and uh, I'm not going to spend that much time there. Technical, for example, and this is a project that is uh, getting built. So in this uh, instance, um, how do you rationalize in a way the panels, um, the twisting in a way, uh, facade panels, and how you create uh, families in a way to reduce the cost, for example. So this is something that we, we did in 2000, um, 2017, 18, no, 2018, yeah. So in this case, this is a neural network that um, is looking at seventy parameters of the of each panel and tries to uh, to find similarities and uh, create families um, of those panels. So, like I was mentioning before, Dpmla or Kupiola actually it's very diverse as style. Uh, it's not a very homogeneous style. Uh, so, because of that reason, it's uh, very crucial how you um, how you analyze data and how you give proper weight to uh, all the projects. And uh, why I'm saying that is because it might be that you have a project that was built and you're going to have more data for that project just because of the reason, because it was built than another project that was not built. But that's not to say that the project that was built is more representative when it comes to style than the other one that was not built. So how you balance then that, that kind of, um, discrepancy yeah and I think this is a topic that also in AI um, is a, a big problem um, there are certain cultures that didn't have the technology to document their history and right now if you run uh, an AI addressing in a way that kind of uh, vast in a way uh, body of work of, uh, of uh, historical documents uh, for sure you are going to create some AIs that have a strong bias towards certain um, cultures just because other cultures are not well um, represented. So here in, um, with Diplom Himmelbau, uh, we have sort of multimodal kind of uh, um, operations. So we have, uh, like I mentioned before, we have um, for every single project, 950 projects, we have uh, physical models, we have renders, we have different phases, like different kind of segmentation uh, of those uh, projects, um, sketches, hand drawing, and all that, yeah. So we use, in a way, all this information to, to train uh, our network. Um, the network, DPM Blau network, when I'm saying DPM uh, DPM Blau network, I'm, uh, we are not talking about one single network. Uh, DPM Blau network, it's a node-based network, meaning that there are uh, something like 50, 60 nodes in the network, and each node describes or represents a different kind of uh, neural network that uh, addresses a specific task. For example, you can have one node that it's a query network, which is mostly trying to imagine in a way um, certain um, perspectives uh, versus a representation learning or other kind of types. And the idea here um, with, with um, the DPM law network, the idea is to, to create the, the structure of the network in such a way that it's easily um, easy to operate as a non uh, AI expert, let's say. Yeah? So any, any um, designer in the office should be able to create new types of connections between uh, the nodes of the network and engage in their own design in a way kind of process, yeah? So this is a very user-friendly in a way uh, kind of interface. You just click here and there, just uh, check boxes that establish in a way the, the connections between the networks that you're using and then the entire uh, system in a way computes, yeah? So here you have like, um, an infinite, in a way, uh, way of connecting networks, and not only um, networks among themselves, but you have also ways how how this kind of um, human machine interaction is happening. Yeah, where can you intervene as a human, and how you can influence perhaps certain things? Yeah, because in certain cases, probably you don't want to have the entire process only generated by AI. Sometimes you want to combine it perhaps with 3D scanning. You want to combine it with uh, photogrammetry and all those kind of uh, techniques. And then um, the, the network, it's set up in such a way that allows you in a way 
for for that kind of input easily. And also here, um, let's see. I'm just stressing, you know, uh, uh, this idea of is the architecture of the network that actually allows uh, this kind of interaction to happen and this kind of like emergent, uh, not emergent, uh, created in a way outcome to happen. And in my opinion, that's why I don't consider this automation because we are not automating anything. Uh, mostly, what we are doing, we are we are um, we have networks that are able to extract insights from uh, from uh, computer lab projects. And then those insights are used in a sort of design process in our um, office by um, by designers. So here we have also like what it means to have groups of designers working and interacting. It's a different kind of relation. And then also uh, designers with designers. So the network is easily re reconfigurable. Um, so you have, again, a, not, a node based kind of network. Yeah? So I'm just going to go uh, very fast over this because, like I said, my goal here is not necessarily to, to present the project, but mostly talk about uh, these ideas of architecture, the import of, uh, importance of the architecture of the network. So I'm just going to skip over this. So we have, we have also um, 3D nodes that are dealing with um, uh, 3D geometry with meshes. And those were uh, just a few examples of that text-based nodes that uh, allow for query. So we have this vast in a way network and uh, the problem all the time is you don't have necessarily designers that are specialized in a way to operate all those sophisticated networks in a way. So um, a text query, then it's a very, very friendly uh, way of starting the search. And then once you start and figure out certain things, then you can continue and uh, engage in other processes. But that, that kind of query, it's kind of understands the, the semantics of, of the, of the Copion Blau style, yeah? And this is something that we trained uh, with, with our own semantics, like text and uh, images, yeah? So just some examples of, of that. And in this case, as you can see, um, at this point, um, at least in this presentation, what I'm showing you is just um, kind of interpolation kind of uh, ability of the network, not so much extrapolations and domain trans transfers, uh, but that's, that's something that uh, it's on the list and uh, we are going to get there. And also we have interiors like uh, uh, designing in a way, um, auditorium interiors, for example, is the same thing, uh, a 3D network that it's able to, is this one running? Probably the video is not running. No, it's quite slow. Um, so the same thing happens. So here, um, I'm just going to um, show the, this last part. So this is another another uh, part that uh, we currently implement into uh, the DPM Blau network, something called Fed Federated Learning. And this was uh, created by Google in 2014, I believe, uh, if I understood correctly from uh, Blaze. Um, they started working in 2014 and they started to publish the first paper on 2016, I believe. Um, but federated, federated learning enables a uh, mobile phone, for example, to collaboratively uh, learn a shared prediction model while keeping all the training data on the device. Yeah. So here, what we are aiming for, we are aiming for this kind of idea of um, how, how can our model, instead of having a centralized model that somehow forces, you know, a designers to, to um, uh, force, forces designers in a certain direction because that's a constraint. Yeah? The kind of results that it's outputting, it's forcing you to, to design perhaps that kind of way. Um, so how can we avoid that? How can we have also the intelligence and the creativity of our designers somehow fit in, in the network and together the network with the designers in a way continue growing in a way, yeah? Uh, so then the idea here is that you as a designer, you can have your mobile phone or you can have your device uh, that you uh, you work during day, you take pictures maybe of physical models, you create renders um, and all that information then represents in a way a sort of personal kind of um, aesthetic or preferences, yeah? And how is it possible then for the network, for the big deep, deep network to learn in a way all those preferences 
and have this kind of nice back and forth kind of um, feedback. Yeah. So the first the first part here, the, mo the model gets personalized um, uh, locally based on usage and the data generated by the user. Yeah. So um, when the device is not in use, for example, the network locally starts to train. Yeah. Starts to train locally with the data set with the kind of information uh, that that you created locally. Yeah. And once that that it's uh, created, uh, all users or all um, designers, in a way, updates or um, data sets that they uh, they uh, generated and they were trained, they are getting aggregated to create a, a sort of uh, consensus in a way change. Yeah? And then from there, uh, the model gets shares with all the users to cycle, and the cycle then repeats. Yeah, so. The model then it's it's trained lo locally when the device is not used. It's almost like similar with this kind of idea of um, um, memory consolidation, yeah, that is happening to is during sleep, yeah. So during day you're working with the device, you're engaging with the network, you have certain uh, uh, ways of engaging with the network. That information is uh, saved. It's uh, saved as a data set, and then the network, when you're not using the device, starts to train with that kind of personalized in a way data set. Uh, data set, yes, and that personalized data set then starts to be uh, fed into the big network, yeah. And you, ha you have this kind of nice loop, uh, feedback loop in a way between human designers, creatives, and uh, the network, yeah. In this way, then you don't have this kind of idea of uh, one centralized AI that actually dictates uh, and forces you in a way in a certain direction. Is this kind of more, more healthy, I'll say, um, collaboration between um, machines and humans, uh, which is, I think, uh, at the core also of our profession, this kind of uh, interaction between architects and designers. That's something that actually um, increases, in a way, the creative output uh, than if you, if you were to just have a scenario where designers are just isolated. Yeah, so uh, personally, I envision in a way this kind of feature. Um, at this point, it's uh, really just uh, in DPM, in Copy of Blau. I'm not sure if this is going to get uh, adopted adopted in a way all over, but I, I find it a more interesting in a way um, kind of model than just to imagine we have Google owning their own AI that's going to dictate how we design or Autodesk or other kind of uh, companies. In this way, at least you have a collaboration and uh, you have networks growing together with humans and designers getting enhanced and enhanced and so on. Yeah? So it's a nice feedback in a way loop. Okay, so um, this this is uh, this is my, my last slide. So um, it's predicted that um, soon every, uh, uh, every architectural element is going to be associated with data broadcasting technology. And for me, it's interesting in a way that topic of um, how, how we are going to design in that kind of uh, environment where we are going to have billions and billions of agents actually interacting, yeah? Because each device, it might be that it's going to, to have a small AI embedded into it. And then that AI is going to interact with other AIs and it's going to interact with you and so on. So here I envision a, a similar thing, yeah, when it comes to when it comes to um, uh, design and uh, architectural phase, how we engage with AI. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. That, that was extraordinary. Um, really, really interesting. I think um, what is over the, over the over the years as we hear more from you, um, where it's kind of it's getting more and more refined um, and. Uh, I think even though there were some things that were similar to what we've heard before, that what was important was that were the changes. And I think the final um, few comments were really very inspiring. It sounds like you're a thousand brain theory for AI. <laughs> um, uh, I wanted to just pick up on something, just to say, that, first of all, I want to mention one thing to, to those who are coming in late. Uh, my apologies if, you, if uh, we didn't pick up the fact that we started effectively one hour early because of American um, uh, the change of the clocks today. Uh, we didn't actually start one too early. Could for the states, we 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 started at the same time, but compared to other countries, um, we we started early. Um, but it's all recorded, so you can always check it um, afterwards. Um, uh, but I want to pick up on that that the kind of thing. I mean, almost like that notion, the frame of reference by which you look at the world, is 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 is, is incredibly 
uh, important in some ways. And I was I, one of the things that, that struck me over the last two sessions in this series. Um, I mean, first week when when you was presenting last week, uh, you know, actually it was it's it's still a kind of human machine interaction, very much so, and there are still architects very much involved in the process that. She, what, what the work that she was showing, and also the work that she wasn't able to show, which I've seen, uh, and it's extraordinary. It's, it's producing really, really interesting um, work, as indeed is 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 um, is Deep Himmelblau, which is also operating effectively the same way. And I think we're getting to a point where, as I said, I think we're getting to a point with the kind of the Sputnik where we say, "Aha, this is what AI can do." But I had a conversation this week with um, with Manu Thangavello, and he was sort of talking about consciousness. And it struck me that really this is a complete red herring as far as AI is concerned. Who cares whether the AI is conscious or not? I mean, um, does anyone care if their Tesla car is, is conscious? Obviously not, right? And uh, indeed, Harari has this view that in fact consciousness could be a problem because you could get distracted by various things. And he talks about the one accident where the car, a uh, Tesla car was, was involved, uh, or a Google car, uh, because the driver was distracted. So we can almost like leave that out of the equation and say, well, who cares about consciousness? We really don't have, as long as it can produce something, it's not important. Um, as Harari says, there are many paths to, to superintelligence, not all of which go through the straits, the straits of, of, of consciousness. Now, that's one thing. The other thing I was kind of struck with was, was the, the, the Jeff Hawkins, who, you know, super interesting kind of theoretical approach, very, very interesting. But in many ways, there was a difference between his approach and, let's say, your Shabak, or indeed my own approach in some sense. He, he takes the view that the intelligence is essentially this a human thing, and whatever we get from, from AI can't really be considered intelligence at all. Um, well, it can be, but it's, it's, it's no longer, it's somehow inferior. So it, it strikes me that almost it's, it's a kind of, you, if you take the other position, you know, which is to say AI is incredible and humans are inferior and, and so on, it's really a question of where you start from, the, the premise, the way in which you frame your argument. And it reminds me in some ways, this is probably something that Patrick would re relate to, the kind of debates that were going on in, in conduct philosophy between the kind of post-structuralist viewpoints, the kind of Derrida and Deleuze, and the more kind of phenomenological, ontological thing. You either take one position or the other, and it depends on which position you take. And once you've taken the position, then the other seems inadequate in some ways. I was, I've always been struck by this, so I won't go into that too much detail, but the point is that it really depends on how you've been trained and how you see the world. Now, just thinking about in terms of neural network, I mean, that's exactly how we see the world. So, you know, in a way, um, and I'm thinking here again of, of let's say, the work of, of Memo Acton and the, and the kind of Memo Acton and the, the idea that if you look at, uh, at an image through the lens of a neural network trained on fire, you'll see fire. If it's trained on flowers, you'll see flowers. <clears throat> and we've been trained to see the world in a certain way. Um, hence, when we look at AI, we see the world in terms of our own framework. And we're constantly using these, these terminologies that, that because we don't know how, we don't know what terms to use for AI, frankly. We, we just, what well, we learn, and we've got intelligence or whatever it was. So we use human terms to try and describe AI. And that, that I think, is really where the problem lies. Because, I mean, you know, obviously it's not the same. And, and I'm just wondering if this isn't just because of the certain moment we're in. You know, this is such a, a still a relatively unfamiliar domain. And all we can do is judge it. By which, by that with which we are familiar, which I think is something you you mentioned yourself, Daniel. Um, so you know, in a way, I want to just go back to that the 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 the, 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 the bird and the plane analogy, which I think is really interesting because when planes started appearing, everyone was seeing them in terms of birds, you know, and and, and that was the, the model, you know. Um, and frankly, birds and planes are well, they, they do fly, but they're they're completely different in many ways. You know, there are things that planes can do that birds could never do, like you know travel uh, uh, faster than the speed of sound and so on and so on and so on and we don't have that hang up anymore we don't we don't sort of you know it's it's not we don't always compare uh, uh, planes with birds uh, and vice versa um and i always think that comment is it a bird is it a plane or is it superman that indicates that we see birds and planes as being radically different from one another and i'm just wondering whether it's it's you know part of our problems in trying in this terminology are, are a bit to do with the kind of teething problems of trying to get our head round what words to use for this new domain um, and the real problems come you know and i think this goes back to melanie mitchell's kind of comments the real problems come when we use terms from our domain like neural um, which are not really um, 
and apply them to the domain of, 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 of AI. Uh, and it's almost like we need a completely new vocabulary. You know, we shouldn't be talking about design. We should be talking about generating. We shouldn't be talking about a design. We should talk about outcomes and so on and so on and so on. And I think I, I really have a problem. In, the more I think about it, the more I have problems with the, the way we use the, the, the word learn and the way we use the word intelligence because uh, it's, they're different. They're so different. And, and, and the fact that we are still framing them from a human perspective um, really means that we're never going to really are able to address and understand them uh, in those terms. It'll, they, AI will always seem inferior to human beings if you take the position of Jeff Hawkins uh, and, and so on and vice versa. So uh, I, I almost feel that's, that's the kind of a problem is, is that we, we simply haven't got to the stage where we've got over that anxiety that we are able to understand AI as something other. We still judge it in, in human terms. I, I don't know what you think about that, uh, Daniel. Yeah, I, I agree. I, uh, I think it's like you're saying, you know, uh, it's a bird, it's a, it's a plane, it's Superman. It's almost like this kind of uh, uh, perceptual resolution in a way. So I increase, I have one percep one resolution, yeah, it's a bird. I increased uh, that resolution, now it's a plane. Oh, I increased the resolution, it's a, it's a man, it's a Superman, yeah. So I think also here, like we, we have the same kind of challenge, like for example, when this kind of question it's leveled um, against AI, is AI creative? It's like very hard, like at which resolution do I have to answer that question? Where, where, where is the, the resolution where the AI is creative versus where the humans creative, yeah? So I think we, we have right now, it's unclear for us where that is, yeah? And I think that's, that's why at this point, we are still using this kind of terms because it's, it's unclear yet, yeah? yeah. Uh, but I think what, once we start to engage a bit more and understand like uh, what's happening, we can easily like uh, uh, define on terms for that for sure. Because um, we always say, yes, the machine is creative, but it's not like humans are creative. Uh, machine, uh, it's able to see, but well, it's not seeing like humans do, you know, but what other term can we use that for that, you know? Um, so uh, I think that's that's something that uh, will be for sure would be great if we can develop that kind of language. Um, I, so I've got another question. Maybe I could ask the first. I know we, we, we're going to open up to questions um, now. I know that Patrick is here with some questions, um, uh, and also Matt Gorby's got a question. Maybe I could just kind of ask you quickly one, and, and I can see Patrick actually you ask one. Um, that is this. Um, I want to just pick up on the thing where you talk about how how the digital design. I think you use the term shaping. Uh, from a warp space. Maybe I got that wrong when you're talking about yeah. how the digital design. And I think that idea of shaping is a kind of a really interesting one because it implies that, I mean, I mean, I think what I, I have problems with both the definitions of, um, of, of a creativity that you refer to, both the one by Margaret Bowden and also um, Demis Vasavis in some sense, because they always talk about the outcome, the product. And you know, to my mind, it is about a process and it's about a process and, and the more I think about it, that, the word shaping I thought was really interesting because if you think about it in terms of materials and how you work with sculpture, you know, you're kind of exploring with the tool and, and, and the material and seeing what comes out of that interaction. And, and it struck me that, that, um, that one of the interesting kind of uh, ways of thinking about it is to think about um, uh, either the logic of affordance in terms of what you can do with a certain material, whether it's, it's digital material as it were, or, or, or physical material, or in terms of... Uh, the kind of uh, the notion of, of, of reinforcement learning, which is kind of similar in some sense, you know, the feedback you get from your materials and things is kind of similar to reinforcement learning. And I always think it's it's fascinating that um, that they've picked up on reinforcement learning and David Silver and others saying, well, this is the, going to be the way we're going to get towards whatever we're going to get to. It's going to be through reinforcement learning. And it strikes me that that model um, which is a bit like the notion of shaping, you know, what you can do, what you can't do, and how you can do, is 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 a much more productive way of thinking about um, uh, about uh, uh, design itself because it's it's about the process it seems and, and the outcome clearly is a result of the process, but you've got no idea necessarily what the outcome is going to be when you start off. I just wanted to throw that at you to see what you think about that. Um, yeah, I think. As long as uh, you as human, you are the one directing away the search and so on. I think um, that warping of the space, it's kind of uh, limited, I'll say, because it depends on you, depends on your limitations in a way. And that's why personally, uh, I'm, I'm a, a big fan of going back to my initial research or, of uh, swarm systems and so on, and have that kind of um, 
almost like bottom up kind of approach to things. Yeah. Like also when it comes to AI, then instead of defining which is the loss function, which is the the, uh, the optimization goal that I'm aiming for, I'm just actually uh, uh, defining the engagement rules in a way, like how two network, uh, what two networks, uh, the two networks are doing, and I allow them to engage. Yeah. And then allow that you know kind of process to manifest, yeah. And that will more likely, in a way, um, be something that expands in a way in that kind of space than if I'm just shaping the space myself, you know. Uh, so for me, that's that's the, the interesting thing, yeah. Otherwise, I think we we end up with the same problem. We are going to constrain things. Uh, we think that we are creative, but we are not really. Yeah, yeah I guess I guess I, I was I, I, that was what I was trying to talk about in some ways. Is to say that you know if we talk about affordances and tools. AI is a tool that you know we can get certain, we can see what we can do with it. So it's always about interaction. It's never about just the, the one genius individual playing with a tool. It's about what the tool allows you to do. So I guess I was trying to. Yeah, no, that. so like this kind of genius individual, like um, I think that's just a sort of myth in a way that, um, um, I mean, that's, that's how we look back at history and we create this kind of myths. And we are not really looking at actually uh, it wasn't just one person in a way there was so many other like inventions and things happening and is this kind of idea of uh, survivorship bias if you if you f are familiar with that idea of survivorship bias you have this kind of uh, image of airplanes returning from world war ii and they have bullet holes in um in the wings and uh, the engineers they were trying to reinforce the wings but actually those were the planes that were turning back. They were coming back, yeah. The ones that were not turning back, it means that they were hit uh, not in the wings, yeah. So those were the, the most uh, crucial parts, yeah. So I think also in history, uh, certain things uh, happen as well. Yeah? If you talk about electricity, like, well, electricity, you cannot have electricity and you cannot have a, a, a light bulb if you don't invent first how to blow uh, air into glass or something, yeah, to create a light bulb, you know. Uh, and all those kind of technologies in a way that, together in a way they lead to that invention and then suddenly you have the master in a way genius or something yeah and i have, i have the feeling that the same goes also um, i know that you were referring to gary uh, in the previous um, um, sessions um the bilbao in a way moment and for me it's like yes i think it's uh, maybe if, if we talk about his repertoire his design space let's say yes he managed to get out in a way of that space let's say but he managed to get out of that space because of Gaudi, uh, Candela, and uh, Luis, uh, Luigi Nervi, probably, yeah? like rule surfaces and so on. Yeah? So he started in a way to, uh, to interpolate like at the larger scale, let's say. Yeah? So first he was just interpolating it in his own design space. And then he started to bring in a way a bigger uh, other concepts. And he managed in a way then to, to develop that logic of rule surfaces. You know? Um, so I think it's always that, that kind of it's not a master genius or something. It's always like a sort of uh... yeah, you know. And I think with with the Gary thing, what I was trying to suggest was actually it was the aha moment for people. They could see oh, but of course he'd been working away at this thing for some time, and suddenly the general public thought oh that works. That that that's in a sense what I was referring to. But uh, uh, Patrick has got I think has got his itching to uh, ask a question. That's right. Well. Good to see you, Daniel, uh, Neil, Hi. and everybody else. So, well, very strong lecture, very interesting. And also, congratulations to the progress you've been making since I saw the work last, particularly the 3D uh, nodes. I mean, you said that, I'm not sure if there's more than one in the, in, in the whole uh, complex Himmelblau machine, let's say. And uh, I do find it fascinating. Um, and I want to come back to that. I do appreciate that you wanted to, uh, that you're defining creativity. Uh, you tend to define, it wasn't 100% clear, but I would urge you maybe perhaps to do it as uh, creative problem solving, or that we, we, we switch away from the core values to be innovation. And then uh, either we, 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 we say creativity for us is always innovative, problem solving, meaning creative problem solving, or we put it, we say creation, creativity could also be the generation of novelty. And uh, then you have, of course, every uh, search algorithm has generated and test. And what we, we can actually define what innovation is. And that's because we know what, if there's is a problem solving, which is novel, and hopefully is also a superior solution. Uh, on top of that, it's sometimes even to have a new route to a, 
Um, anyway, so I think that's not so difficult. So we can, and, and, and if, if we break through to that, then we do have the Sputnik moment with these techniques. Uh, and so, but, so the, the, the problem solving is, is, the, is, is the key. And when we look at, if you look at these GANs and the way they set up these, the, the, disc, uh, the generator and the discriminator, the difference to these and to what I guess you are doing, trying to do with reaching beyond uh, the interpolate is um, there you have an objective function in a sense, is it a, a real sample or is it an inverted commas fake or new sample? And uh, I suspect you also have that element initially in your, in your, in your garden. Um, so when, when, when I find uh, fascinating is now, first of all, I have a number of questions. Do you really need um, so many subnetworks? Let's say you have organization to test. I don't know how you do that. Maybe there's an underlying plan, which, which, which somehow needs to be co co correlated and coordinated with, with the massing. And that is a subselection, perhaps. Um, I mean, by the way, I think the Himmelblau is incredibly complex sorts of compositions. They have a wide range, which makes it interesting, but also difficult. But when it comes to a, a let's say, Gestalt, which is really a, a strong element, which I've always been interested in. Uh, so I suspect that um, you don't have an internal representation of the, uh, of an, as an objective measure, right? This is, I suspect, uh, whether it's something is successful to start or not, comes from architects. That's why you're still talking about uh, the, the system which has the human evaluator somehow in in the, in the system, and maybe feeding back. But, but what I just still wanted to suggest that, particularly since you want to reach that moment, you don't want to just gen generate novelty. You don't want to remain in the realm of the subjective. And I'm, by the way, I'm very fascinated that you did find, for instance, you used the, the uh, neural network to optimize for smallest amounts of family of panels. Probably there will be alternative ways, but I'm, I'm, that's the question I also have. Can you attach, touch on that? But my question would then be, wouldn't it be as reasonable if we want to break, if we want to develop an objective criterion uh, uh, which measures innovation and then let the algorithms work up against that. Do, can we try to, and that's what I've been trying to think through, define something like a successful composition? And how could we optimize that? So for instance, there is what I've always, my formula has been, you know, legibility in the face of complexity. So, on the, so, so successful, what is the superior composition that has many parts? But maybe they become difficult to discriminate, and maybe there's a difficulty of passing and labeling parts, or even just passing parts in these convoluted things. So there might be something where you have the vision system, which might be a visual passing, maybe giving many perspectives, or giving you know maybe a primary perspective, uh, dominating. So anyway, I'm suggesting, uh, and I ask you whether you find it reasonable, meaningful, uh, to to. Uh, in a way, if you want to go beyond the, 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 the given uh, catalog into something new, you need expert knowledge. You need theory. That's my, my challenge to you. And that would then be, can then be, but it can then be al algorithmized. Final question so, I had was, was uh, with the federated learning. I, sus I wonder, I mean, it's for me to some extent, the human coming in as a neural, as a biological neural network as an evaluation criteria, which is non which is exogenous, is kind of federated learning because we cannot upload the data set into the system. Don't talk about mobile phones. I think that's more about uh, the question of privacy, mm -hmm. and which you, do, you don't have that problem in your case. So yeah. why wouldn't, if you don't have privacy constraints, why wouldn't you all upload it? Problem is we can't easily upload mm -hmm. it. Uh, so, so anyway, I just wanted to clarify this because you, you described the federated learning as if it was you know, and I don't think it's a data management thing that you would have to upload the data. I mean, so so just to clarify that. Anyway, the challenge is this: expert systems must come in uh, to 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 home in on that into that making an extrapolative AI system generate innovation because we don't want just a, a, a novelty machine. So what's happening in the in the Sagrada Familia project? Uh, you're asking why so many networks in a way. 
and yeah. you can see in a way um, all those connections are almost like checkpoints. Yeah. Um, so I was showing uh, you have network uh, one and three um, that it's used as the, the latent space of those networks are actually uh, the data set for the, the, uh, the network six. Yeah. And uh, you might wonder, well, why not just have some images? Why do you need the latent space? Yeah. And the reason why you need the latent space there is because once you have the latent space, just a representation of something, now I can go in as an expert and I can analyze, I can under, uh, extract the features and I can uh, understand which ones are important, which are not important, yeah? So then I do that kind of process. My cat is going to jump here, sorry. <laughs> um, so um, I do that kind of process so that I can identify which are the main features. And then once I identify those, those features are going towards the, the, the other network, yeah? That were six, yeah? So in that way, there is a curation that's happening in between there. Yeah? So you have all these pieces, but before you let everything run together, you have like this kind of checkpoint where as a, as a uh, human evaluator, in a way, I can look at those results and I can understand, okay, these are the main features. They have to be uh, enhanced a bit. The network has to understand that these are uh, the most relevant ones that I'm interested in. You know, so like that, it's almost like you're going manually and fine tuning in a way those kind of uh, features. And similar things happen also in the deep neural network. Uh, so we have, of course, we have the human evaluator at the end that looks at the results and evaluates them. Uh, but before that, when the network trains, like how do you balance in a way the features? Like I was saying, you know, you have certain uh, projects that are more represented than other. So how do you balance those? Because just because you're less represented, that doesn't mean that uh, uh, it's not an important feature for the, for the style or for the, yeah, for the network. So those kind of uh, networks, those kind of collections and chain networks, that's, that's uh, what their role there, yeah? Um, so um, the other question was about uh, uh, federated learning. If, if it's not just a data management, or something. Um, so no, I, I think why I find that uh, idea interesting is because um, right now, uh, if you just have a network, which is uh, this kind of network, not uh, node-based network, you still have you have no way to to encode like uh, the subjective designer in a way preferences, intentions, in a way, into that network. It's always like a sort of historical, let's say, data. Yeah? It's never like how the design interacts and which are the, the features that are mostly, uh, most of the time, picked and so on. Yeah? Because like that, once you start to record those things, you can create a sort of, not objective, but a, a sort of model of evaluation thing, of evaluating things. Once you start to realize in a way which, which are the, the kind of um, features that are uh, mostly used and how they are interpreted and so on. So you can create a model of how a human will evaluate things in a way. So for me, that's, that's an interesting thing, not necessarily the fact that you can distribute data and it's not about privacy uh, because we don't have that problem in the office. Uh, but it's just something that I like in a way, also philosophically, I, I like this idea more than just having uh, one big centralized model. And then that model in a way uh, has no way to be influenced by, by external factors in a way. Is that answering your question? To, to some extent, I was, uh, um, you could still have, all, I was thinking more of it that the, the system where the various humans uh, become those locked away uh, networks uh, where their data aren't revealed, but their that their results are, are fed into the into the in, into the neural network, and, and otherwise, if they had data on their phone, why don't you just collect them all? And uh, so, it's, but so so that is for me it's still unclear. But I was I was worrying I was wanted to know also I was referring to the vision system and the role of the vision system in the Himmelblau. Um, uh, set up, what kind of checkpoint is that for you? Is that mediating between 3D model and, and photos? It's, it's at multiple level, I would say. It's not only 3D. And uh, vision, uh, if we refer to vision as, as we humans see, then it's a different thing. Uh, but you can apply machine visions also to, uh, to uh, 3D meshes and just read actually the, um, the, comp the relation in a way between vertices perhaps of the mesh. Yeah? And that's sort of evaluation in the same kind of manner. Um, so there, I have like multiple, multiple, uh, those kind of uh, systems that are looking at the data 
And uh, before before then you go and training, you have like a sort of idea of how you augment this data so that in the end, when the machine trains, it's training correctly. Yeah? So that's that's the, the trick there. Yeah? You try to evaluate it. And then once you figure out like these are underrepresented, this style, this, uh, this kind of feature is uh, important. How do I augment this so that I can have a fair balance in a way with the others? Yeah, that's all right. Can I just pick up on one thing? I mean, the, the question about problem solving that um, Patrick raises, it's kind of an interesting one because it kind of reminds me of, of, first of all, the comment that Elon Musk makes, right? I mean, he, that's why he thinks this Hitchhiker's Guide to the, the, to the Galaxy is such an interesting book because he's pointing out that you can't come up with the answer until you formulate the question in the right way. It's, it's all about addressing problems. And it kind of reminds me in a sense with, um, of exactly the same similar point that, that Tom Main often makes. He's kind of saying that, uh, well, yeah, you've got to identify what the problem is and it's really a question of, once you've got the problem, you can come up, you can address it and, and come up with an answer. But what is interesting about Tom Main is, is that he, uh, I've heard him say before, he's not so interested in, in, in beauty, in, 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 in what, what things look like. Um, and yet it's kind of, perverse because what he does is always always very very beautiful but it tends to suggest therefore that the, these are these perceptions of what of what is beautiful you don't self-consciously address them but maybe they're there so um and i just and i i just wondering how you can you look at the question of beauty and compare it to the question of creativity i think there are similar similar issues in the sense i think do think that creativity is in the eye of, in the eye of the beholder personally i think that's the case and i'm just wondering whether i mean even if you know when you're you're being creative you're not self-consciously being creative. You're just addressing the problem. It's just that create you're, what you're the way you're looking at the world is might might be imbued with a certain let's say creativity um, because of your disposition. Maybe I can just put that to you as a yeah. If I just interject just very briefly, I mean I like what you said, Daniel, that you look at the creativity of a scientist more than the creative artist, and we in particular I think the worst paradigm is the let's say modern or contemporary artist where there isn't a problem and it's pure novelty and pure uh, mutation but so i think that's very important um, um constraint to direct your and then the question is in your uh, in in your uh, appraisal of massing models yes you can check let the system check whether it fits within the repertoire or not but uh, to, to, let's say if we don't have to that would be just a yes or no or, or closer or less close but is there some kind of ranking uh, you you could feed in and let the novelty you know can we can we rationalize that and that, for me is it, let's say to some extent the intuitive appraisal of within a trained up group like Kobe Himmelblau that kind of office or Wolf himself evolving his his uh, quick appreciation and judgment there is um, and and that's initially just this appeals as a, it's there is an underlying rationality, which I think we can start to try to um, um, unpack and um, put into set of measures. That's you know with the formal, for instance, maintaining legibility in the face of complexity. Um, that that's one of my suggestion. So beauty can be rationalized, but it's not a universal. It's 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 a domain specific concept of beauty which is maybe you know which closely connected to a style uh, um, uh, and and there, there would be a Himmel, you know Himmelblau style is different from ZHJ style but they also together share more features than a Chipperfield uh, style and concept of beauty so these the, uh, I believe that because there's also you can train up a whole group of uh, collaborators and we, we can all appreciate maybe not all have a generative talent but we all in the in our firm let's say in particular z cluster 30 40 people uh, we, we we if we can be trained up to have a degree of coherency and you use that phrase uh coherent interpolation or coherence you know of judgment that in a sense there must be an underlying sort of principles it's difficult to get at so similar with the language users, there's still not an explicit expert grammar which is fully representing our language knowledge, but there are. And so, so that's where I'm coming from. What I'm suggesting is to, can you crack that with respect to the Himmel 
principle of, let's say, shape, grammar, or aesthetic, the principles, the underlying principle of the aesthetics, can you get to them and make the machine compatible? So at, at this point, I think just because you operate within uh, one repertoire in a way, just one office and one, one style, yeah. I think uh, it's, a, it's a doable task in a way. At, at yeah. this point, I, I, I cannot say that I have something like that. Uh, but I can imagine in a way how, how that can, can be done. Yeah? Uh, but it's just a matter of uh, how to properly assess those things and how to give proper meaning or value to them. Yeah? Uh, to extract, I think, is quite easy. But then to, uh, to also give the meaning of it, what it means, this kind of feature versus the other kind of feature, what that, uh, does it represent for the beauty of, of it? Is that the thing that makes it beautiful or not? I think those, those kind of things have to be like uh, really evaluate it and uh, probably you can use uh, machines to to help you in a way in that process it's not uh, that much a labor intensive in a way kind of process uh, but but yeah I, i'll imagine yeah could, could be especially if we are talking about one specific office the same repertoire in a way and i agree also with this kind of idea like uh, it's interesting like to see also which are the shared in a way features you know from here and there and um I would love to have like multiple lives to be able to, to expand on those kind of exactly. things. Um, but I would will, I will love to see some researchers in a way trying to look at you know, multiple I just, offices. I just want to, uh, well, stay with one office is perfectly fine. <laughs> I mean, and it's uh, the, uh, you know, you said something, some things, some outcomes might be too novel to be uh, appreciated and therefore they have no value. And yeah. that, that we need to question. So the, but what I'm trying to get at is there is something underlying uh, where we, you know, where we, where we could be, ex get you, where you get all the, um, the, uh, the participants, let's say all the evaluators, the 30, 40 evaluators you have there to, 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 uh, to warm up to this. Uh, so, unfamiliar solution after a while and then you find out that it fits an underlying analytically rationalized set of criteria which are more which are no longer that subjective that's a and and anyway that's a that's a challenge i think i think i'm i'm thinking almost like at this kind of level if you're looking there are a lot of things that are way ahead of their time and that's why they're not they have no value uh, for example neural networks they had no value in uh 90, 40 or something, yeah? even if they are amazing. yeah. But no one was, I mean, beside uh, Alan Turing, uh, no one was able to look at them and to really say, we can do something with, with this. yeah. And uh, it has to do also with this aspect of technology. Yeah? Like there were a lot of other aspects that uh, made that idea impossible. Yeah? And, and I think also our ability to recognize uh, um, a new idea as being a novel idea has to do also with that kind of context, perhaps cultural context, to understand how, or to have the vision, how that idea could be something. Sorry, my cat is just- Well, I love, here. I mean, Neil mentioned in the, the moment of Sputnik, the Sputnik moment. And the, the, the difficulty is to find, to find this trajectory of search, which where, where, where something quite novel would still be respected as an innovation. And I think that if you go back to the history of last 30, 40 years, there are, I think, some, some moments where the, where the whole, where a whole kind of informed and trained up generation of protagonists is converging rapidly around, mm -hmm. around the concept, for instance, which, which was start to be actually like the Parc de la Villette superposition idea, or, and, and then, and then the, uh, you know, then make, the next step was in the early nineties. The, the uh, so you're, on, you're in the search of complexity and 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 in, uh, you're on some kind of search which in which a new, a new something out of the box fits it and everybody gets it quite quickly. So this is this is what you what that's the holy grail. That's the Sputnik moment. <laughs> and, and then how do you set yourselves up for for that? That's the question. I mean, the, the next one was the you know things like. Um, um, the early uh, folding repertoires which came through, you know, from the animation industry and how everybody 
who was itch, itching towards that, let's say, like Zadi, the architects, or Zaha with, with 10 years of handwork. It was just suddenly, uh, we were all kind of jumping on that. That was just another Sputnik moment. So, so in a way, you have to, uh, I don't know if the, how the AI helps with that, but that's the, that's the, that would be that's the holy grail, I guess. <laughs> Maybe I just want, just to kind of in terms of the splitting moment, there are maybe two phenomena. One is the kind of uh, it's like what you were talking about this kind of uh, this sudden clustering of ideas and things, which it, it's almost <laughs> like there's a there's um, a perfect storm right now, and lots of people coming together all together. Now that I would say was akin to sort of the things that were happening in the late eighties in terms of the decon exhibition. Someone recognised, holy shit, there's something happening here, and, and there all these ideas. There's one thing. But I think the Sputnik moment really was, for me, was, 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 was the Bill, 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 Bill Bao. Um, uh, and that, of course, was a question I put to Zaha. The last question I ever asked her was that, was how important was that? And it was really important because the public began to realize, yes, we can do this. So there are two sort of, and I think the Sputnik moment, I would refer to that. And I, it's always interesting because it, it's always a relational thing. We, we discover how good things are in relation to Gary Kasparov or Lisa Dahl. And as soon as this, this is why I think it's so important, as soon as, uh, as Snowheta and, and whatever, or Zahar, even the and NVRDB are beaten by AI, in, like a chess game, then we will really begin to realize and understand what, what, what is happening. Um, I just wanted, uh, I will now ask, I will bring Matt in a second. I just want to make one, just one point. That is to say, I'm wondering whether the problem of style is almost, is almost as similar to the problem of creativity. In other words, the real problem when it comes to style is when people retrospectively say, oh, that's this or that's that. And actually the way that, that in an office I imagine it's happening is you always frame within your own aesthetic preferences, largely in the way that, that in sense that Deep Pimmelblau is framed by the work of Carl Pimmelblau and you're producing something within a context and so on. And it's a process based thing. It's not the final result. And I think the problem about style is that often historians look at the final result and say, that's that and that's, and that's something else. I just want to throw that in there as a, as a, as a thought. Uh, so maybe, maybe Matt, you, would you like to, to ask your question? You have had two questions here. Certainly. Uh, I hope, I hope you can see me. Okay. Um, thank, thanks. First of all, I, I really appreciate seeing this laid out and step-by-step step the way you're talking about theory and then into practice and specifically around the way you're at the end of the day, doing a, a meta design of a tool that, that people who are not AI experts can start to use because in, is this is close to me. In at the end of my, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how great these systems are if only certain people who have a certain kind of skill set can use them. So I really appreciated seeing that. I have I have two questions. One's kind of a clarification, and then the other is a bit more theoretical. And uh, at first, the the clarification is when you were showing. Uh, I mean, I appreciate that GANs are at the core of this networks, and then networks gatekeeping and control, and other networks, and more networks on top of networks. So it's building blocks. Um, it, it seemed to me that what you were saying with the federated networks um, was that as people contribute from their own devices or their own situations, um, there's some you know memory consolidation of some sort, some kind of learning and training that happens. Is this development of of, of new networks that are now joining the system, um, or is it adjusting the the sort of evaluative parameters of the discriminators within the existing networks? Um, so I'll, I'll I'll ask that question on the table, but then want to also have you address, if you can, um, a question that is maybe more fundamental to me, which is um, if GANs are at the, at the heart of this, it, and I, as I understand them, there's a generator that is generating lots of things, and then there's a discriminator or an evaluator that's evaluating them. And it's, it's inherently adversarial, it's inherently hierarchical, there's a judgment happening. Yes, this is better, this is better, you're getting closer, closer, closer to something. And a lot of this discussion has been about what is that something and how do we generate that something for each of these levels? And, scopes, I guess, that you're talking about. Um, and I wonder, I mean, that's really interesting and it's been sort of, you know, caught fire in the world, but there's lots of other conversational dynamics that can be modeled between two entities that other than I know, and I'm going to tell you how close you got. Um, and so I'm wondering if in your research or also in, in the direction that you're seeing any interesting stuff happening, other conversational models that um, deal more with sort of knowledge integration or arriving at a shared you know, previously unknown um, uh, agreement, uh, agreement systems, those kinds of things. And I think a lot of work has been done on that. I mean, since the 1940s, there's a lot of stuff on conversational theory and in cybernetics and in, in other ways of coming together other than simple, a simple evaluation. So I wonder if there is a building block at the, at the core of this that might be a little uh, different than a GAN, and if that's part of your research or thoughts. So love your input on all of that. 
thank you for the question. Um, so the, the first one, federated uh, learning. Um, so the idea is what you have is each device has an instance of the, uh, of the main network. Yeah? And then um, what's happening is during day, let's say the user interacts with the, with the network. Yeah? Uh, by uh, engaging in that kind of interaction, there's certain data that is generated, either just the interaction or new data like images or other things. Yeah. Um, so during uh, when the uh, the device it's uh, let's say on standby, no one is using it, the network starts to train. Yeah. The instance of the network of the main network starts to train. Yeah. And then once that that is happening, yeah, that the, uh, all those devices, all those instances on all the devices. They are pulled in a way uh, together, and then there is a consensus there, and then moves to the main network, and then loops back. Yeah. So always you have that kind of consolidation in a way of uh, you have multiple users, consolidation of memory for each, but then everything gets into a pool and then it gets sent back. Yeah. So each. So just to clarify that, sorry, if if I if I'm a new user coming into this system with my new phone and I download your data or your your app or whatever. Um, that's creating a new small network on my phone. Yes. And then it's the model that gets trained from my network that goes back in as one of those tiny little GANs that you were showing yeah. that are then able to be networked or, or, and or certain, prioritized certain weights, or whatnot. Yeah. yeah. And certain weights, then they are uh, going to be sent to the pool. And then those weights, you know, I, they are, they, there is a consensus that is being established there. And then you send those weights to the main network. Oh, okay. I understand. Yeah. Keeps on doing yeah. that. Yeah. That, that makes sense, yeah. Okay, uh, and what about the question. other question? <laughs> <laughs> the second question. Um, so right now, uh, mostly, yeah, we have just uh, adversarial. Um, I would love to have also networks that are collaborating more than just uh, fighting. Um, yeah. But I think conceptually, I'm thinking about that, but I, I don't, I, I cannot say that uh, I have something uh, working there. Um, but I think that will be interesting, you know, uh, in this kind of aspect of, um, consolidating in a way knowledge or something like you were also uh, talking about. So probably that will be something interesting. Uh, at this point, I, I I don't know how I'm going to do that, but. Well, I think there's, I mean, just to pick up on that, and this is pretty new to me as well. So I, I'm just starting to look at this, but you know, you were referencing stuff that happened in the 1940s and 50s and, and the neural networks that came out of that. But, you know, at the time, I think, and again, I like what you said about the, the technology wasn't there. So I have a, so sort of this feeling like when the technology is not there, it actually allows people in some ways to be more creative about their theories of how things might go because they're not focused on, on what they see in front of them and, and mm -hmm. its impact. Um, but at that time, there were, you know, there were a lot of people in the, in the sort of in the cybernetics community, I guess, with the Macy lectures and the, sort of this discussion of, of um, conversation theory. And I think more recently, uh, Pangaro talks a lot about this and um, Pask was building these machines that weren't, that weren't based on you know necessarily just taking the history and creating more of that same and evaluating them but instead based on taking the moment and so rather than just judging they're actually asking questions so like well okay these are the ones you came up with why did you come up with these ones and they're adding more input and that sort of makes a richer model right now i think adversarial networks are you know they were the first thing that 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 was super easy to to, to program and then you get more and more and more of them you pile them all together you get something that looks really extraordinary and impactful but at the core you're still saying I know the thing I'm looking for and you're getting closer or you're getting further away. You're not saying, hey, let's build a thing together. And there's some really interesting theoretical models for how you might build that in a system that I think could be exciting as building blocks fundamentally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. think that's very insightful. Uh, I think that's a really good idea. I mean, I also feel like this, I mean, it's been recently, up, recently looking at dynamical systems and also co-evolution. So you have the two types. You have the, you have the uh, competitive co-evolution, which is basically the arms race which is mm -hmm. what, what the GAN represents. And then you have cooperative co-evolution, which is also increasing complexity in each and, and, and newer, but there is an overall, it's more, um, uh, it's, it's maybe more inverted commas prone to generate novelty, perhaps through innovation, uh, yeah. than homing in on, 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 on optimization. So I think these need to be looked right. at. It's, 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 it's also between negative and positive feedback systems and I was wondering to ask you about whether you, you, you whether, whether you have uh, you have these kind of checkpoints. Are there just control points with negative feedback, or all you have positive feedback? Uh, you know, amplifying <laughs> loops. 
Well, in some cases you have that for sure. Um, but I think and for me, always the, the big question is how you set up interactions between networks, yeah? So because you, you can establish a co, uh, networks that cooperate in a way, yeah? but unless you, you figure out like the, the architecture of it, how to put it together and how to make it work on, on um, devices, um, it, it's just a nice theoretical idea, you know? Yeah. And uh, GANs, for example, um, GANs, they were lucky that they were invented in um, um, 2016, yeah? Um, if I'm 14, 14, 16, yeah? Because exactly uh, during that period, like uh, you start to have a lot of GPUs that start to increase in power and so on. So they, they were able actually to train the model and to prove that it's working, yeah? Without te that technology, today we wouldn't talk about GANs, yeah, for example, yeah? So I think uh, for me, it's this kind of aspect of, yes, I would love to have almost like a swarm in a way of, uh, of AIs that some of them, they have this kind of like prey, um, Predatory kind Predator of, kind of uh, in, in a way, relation. Others, uh, they, they cooperate and so on. Yeah. But for that, in a way, you kind of need a big computer. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and, I was just uh, wanting to ask Matt. I mean, you mentioned Gordon. Uh, and it's very difficult to get to the bottom of this. I mean, I have these huge volumes, densely printed with, 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 with complex diagrams. You can f fold them out into. I don't know how much this it was actually uh, working or operationalizable. I mean, I, I I don't know if you had you've, you've dug into this. It's fascinating, but it's <laughs> it's probably. I mean, also I need another life half an hour <laughs> to even comprehend that. I'm not sure if it's worthy the journey, but beginning to. But but okay. again, it's You're it's, digging it's in, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but again, I think okay. it's interesting because it's like it's like somebody influenced by neural nets, you know and did yeah. some work, yeah. but then somebody rediscovers it, right? So now it's kind of this process of potentially going back and saying, what did we miss when we got so excited about this one thing? Like maybe there's some other stuff there. And now that our computers are more powerful, maybe we can actually model that. And I think there are some really nice models, but a lot of them are hidden or there's some behind the big flashy cool stuff that's coming out from the other models. So yeah, agree, it'd be nice to bring them together. So we'll see, I mean, who knows? <laughs> Thank you for throw, throw something in there? I, I think can I just add something? Okay, I must, must go ahead, yeah. So Neil, just picking up on, on Daniel's comment about this kind of earlier stepping stone, which was fed into another problem, I just wanted to kind of bring up this kind of notion of two kinds of invention, you know, as historically discussed by people like Claparet, who was an, an urologist in the beginning of the 20th century. And I think it ties back to the discussion you had earlier about the kind of resolution at look, about looking at, at different, different kind of things. And I think this is important in regards to whether we assess something as creative or not. And so based on, you know, that historical distinction, there is a kind of invention process which starts with a question and leads to a particular solution. And there's another kind of process which actually finds answers without necessarily having associated them with specific problems. And it's widely accepted that that second kind of invention is the one on which civilization has been largely built. You know, it, it's, it's, an interesting, um, it's an interesting thought because I think it... it it's not really offered as an excuse for saying that anything could be potentially creative, but if we really think about it, I think on many, many, many levels, you know, we, we can, um, go, that going back to the distinction between how people assess creativity, and Neil, you mentioned that both Bowden's and Hasabis' descriptions, they focus on the product, not so much on the process. But if, if, we, if we start to look at isolated processes as potentially being creative, uh, at this point, not knowing, you know, that maybe a few years later, uh, so something that uh, a very particular task, which today seems useful without necessarily being able to pinpoint exactly its situation or the context in which it's situated. Then a few years later, we suddenly realize that this is exactly the answer that we're looking for to some other problem. So I think maybe this is all kind of let's say taken for granted, but I think the bigger picture is to, to, if we look beyond one particular domain, then perhaps we can start to see those relationships, which are now maybe more latent. Can I just uh, add something? I want to bring in Marina in a second, uh, just to say that I, I just, the, I think Matt, your question was really great. And I just, I, I think that really there's a problem with the GAN in some ways, you know, because it's only judging by a limited set of criteria. 
Uh, but it struck me that there's a secondary GAN in operation because we're judging the GAN, right? That's the kind of the weird thing, um, which, which, which means, you know, so you can only judge something by what you know already. So in other words, that's what we're saying about creativity. Therefore, that's the limitation also of a GAN. So, which is, which is, so we, have, we suffer the same kind of limitation. But there's another thought I want to bring in, in terms of the GAN, and that is to say what's happening with the GAN is, is the, 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 um, the discriminator is also being trained. So actually, we are also being trained by the products of GANs over time as a kind of process. So AI is in some ways training us, uh, just, just as a kind of thought, thought to put out there. Uh, I, I, Marina, would you like to uh, put your, ask your question? Yes. Uh, hi. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. And thank you, Daniel, for your presentation. It's uh, an amazing presentation. I, and, and I wanted just to maybe follow in that comment of Neil, like I absolutely, absolutely agree with your comment about, I mean, following that, this idea that uh, about history that finally machines change us. It's not just that we invented machines and then uh, we can, in a way, manage the, all the, the, the results from that, but this also uh, this logic in which we are uh, changed by machines. And, um, but anyway, my, my question I was wondering, um, as there is in your models, uh, this is more like philosophical understanding of that, but uh, as there is in your models like a space of possible states of a system, uh, how could you find or how could we find uh, singularities in that space? which is different from the idea of novelty. Uh, so what do you us. think about it? Who's, who's us? <laughs> who's I am us? asking. No, I'm who's asking. us? You're saying ah, who's uh, us? Ah, yeah. yeah, well, that's interesting as well, because us, I believe it could be uh, uh, human beings and machines, uh, in a way, working together. I don't know if it's still possible to divide uh, humans from machines right now. <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure exactly how to answer. <laughs> how to answer that question. Yeah, I'm I mean, not sure. because I, I was thinking like, uh, you have these kind of uh, examples which seem to be like more discrete. But if you see like this in this, uh, uh, this kind of space of possible states, like a kind of continuity, uh, then you will find like certain kind of singularity, which is not like something like emerge like a kind of novelty. It's something just that uh, produce a difference from the invariant of the model. Uh, so that's that's my question. How can we, in a way, um, identify that singularity? Um, yeah. Yeah, for for me, it's qu quite hard to answer that because. Um... I don't know how, how will that work, uh, to be honest. I mean, I can give a generic answer, but um, I, I don't see exactly how, how that will work at this point. Uh, the way that the network is set up, the DPN Blau network, uh, in, if you are talking about that network, if you talk about DPN Blau network. Uh, so right now it's wide open, like any kind of combination, any kind of like uh, uh, strategy, it's, up to the designer in a way to, to define that strategy. Yeah? And uh, in that sense, uh, I don't know, maybe there are certain patterns that, that uh, get uh, to be developed, like uh, similar patterns that designers engage in. And maybe that's, uh, that's going to help at, um, find in a way um, this kind of unique or the same kind of moment all the time. But uh, yeah, be, behind that, I, I'm not sure exactly how to answer. Sorry. <laughs> Marina, to, 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 no, okay. do, do, do you have an answer? Normally, when people that ask a question, they yeah, I mean, that's why I was asking who's with you because <laughs> that's that, that, that part of uh, making questions that you just <laughs> think about it like with the, with the rest of the, I mean, with the, with, with the rest of the team in this case. But uh, I, I mean, I was uh, thinking about this question because we usually tend to talk about uh, like models but we don't define exactly what models are we talking about. And there are like kind of uh, theories of models. There is a theory of model, like for example, like the mathematical models, when you have like this kind of invariant model, and then you have like this kind of understanding of the um, uh, kind of a singularity when you can um, 
like you have like Henry Poincaré, for example, theory, and then you have like a, you uh, have this kind of you you look these models as possibility of spaces, like it's the same that you produce it in a way with the with the networks, and then you assign a dimension of the space uh, for uh, each degree of freedom of that uh, system, and then you in a way define where are like these um, kind of special lines of points. You was talking about certain densities or certain, you know, like a kind of a curvature of the lines that you were seeing. Like if we think about this as a formal, from a formal point of view, uh, but in a way, so you ident identify that like, this kind of singularity there. So I was thinking like there is a way of training uh, um, the network in order to find this singularity when you go from one point to another, like kind of inflection in the system or something that you can identify or process in a way. I don't, I don't have the answer, of course, <laughs> but it's like something that we uh, usually do uh, as designers. And I don't know exactly how this could work in terms of, uh, of, of, the, of, of your process of design, of your process to uh, analyze the, the, the data you're working on. I think, uh, like like I was saying during the lecture, like uh, if we ma if we can deconstruct it and we can put a measure on it somehow to quantify that, then yes, uh, it's uh, quite easy then to create a model that will find in a way those those moments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, but unless you're able to do that, the network by itself, I'm not sure it's going to be able to do that. Yeah, uh, even if we talk about um, about uh, unsupervised learning. Yes, unsupervised learning, it's great. It's going to figure out some relations, but it's still you that has to go inside and understand those uh, relations in a way, you know? Uh, so in, the, in that instance, yeah, like if we are able to, to uh, deconstruct that singularity that you're talking about, then yes, it's possible. If we cannot do that, if we cannot deconstruct it, then, uh, then probably not. Thank you, Daniel, sorry for my question. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. A, a very tough one. Thank you. <laughs> tough, tough is good, right? Um, yeah. Uh, uh, Matt, Matt's got a comment. I wondered if you wanted to make, make your comment, um, Matt, um, from the chat. Oh, um, <clears throat> right. I was, sorry, I'm back. I was just following up on, um, on the point that Manos made about, and also it's come up a couple of times about what are the, what's the goal of this creative approach? And it reminds me of something that I was um, that I saw <clears throat> has really stayed with me from um, Rich Gold, who was a, a researcher and sort of philosopher at Xerox Park in the '90s, and he he had this great graph of art, science, design, and engineering. Um, and people often think of of science and engineering as things that go together, and uh, art and design as things that go together. But when you look at the problem spaces they're looking at, you know it's art and science that are both doing the blue sky search, like looking for truth, looking out, you know, for an unbounded sort of new thing that we can then possibly, as you were saying, Manos, in the future, we've discovered something, maybe it folds back into some application practical, right? And if you look across the bottom, design and engineering are both these bounded things. You're looking for a creative solution to a specific problem, right? So in an engineering world, you want to be creative, but you're creative to a to to a focused thing to try to find the right solution for this uh, in design as well. It's like you have a brief and you're trying to find the creative solution to that brief. So in, in a lot of ways, engineering and design are much more closely related and art and science are much more closely related, but people tend to make the relationship the other way between art, design, science and engineering. So I just found that fascinating. I think it's one way to think about creativity. I mean, I want to ask another question, Daniel. So, I mean, which is more giving val more value to automation and interpolation as, as techniques in the design process. So I think I, I looked at the 3D sampling, I mean, the 3D generations, and they looked good and they, they looked diverse. So I was quite, it, 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 you know, it makes me think that this is actually quite valuable. And I wonder whether this, First of all, my one question was, what is the role of many art of then, do you need all the images still? Um, is there not too much going on? Let's focus on massing. But what I would look for as a, a, as a designer, as a streamlined design process is some kind of then constraint. For instance, uh, you said 
you know, for instance, number of uh, expressed parts um, and maybe uh, overall uh, volume. Can you do this? So this and, and, and maybe even a side constraint. Can, can this, can, is that, are you at the stage, would you be able to incorporate those? Uh, then I would say, okay, let's forget the, for a moment, put the holy grail of radical um, um, thrilling innovation to another level, uh, escaping the box to one side. There's a lot of value, I think, in, uh, in these interpolations. And they have kind of minor uh, innovation as well, or it's a creativity in a sense of uh, having, having uh, you know, maybe things which not, which which semi accidentally have some some new stimulation as, or difference and are not read as a repetition, but, but be, simply because the site and the, the size and the number of expressed parts which would come from a brief. So, what do you think about such a project, which would be more, uh, which you could actually package up and 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 make as a schema for different companies? Because uh, I would love to get into, I would love to have such a package. Um, so the idea, well, was, uh, the idea yeah. of interpolation, like for me, um, many times, like um, I think any kind of data set that I'm putting together, I will always create an interpolative in a way model for that data set. And the reason why I'm doing that is because uh, I'm going to have in, within that model, I'm going to have almost like a, li a life in a way model of uh, relations, yeah? And then once I have that, I can start to say, um, I'm going to have a different model, let's say a model that is defines maybe the massing on a site or the constraints of a site, yeah? And then I have the, uh, the model that defines just the aesthetics or extravagance, yeah. formal yeah. extravagance or something. And then what I can say is then, okay, so I have two models that are live now, yeah? I have control over them. I'm able to go inside, control the features and so on. So I can say, I'm only interested from this model. I'm just interested in this level of resolution, like um, surface level kind of details. Yeah. But when it comes to messing, I'm going to take the other model. So I can swap in a way and say the levels, uh, if I'm looking in the latent space of that interpretive model, if I look at level, let's say 32 by 32, I'm going to find the composition of the site. Yeah? So I can take that composition and uh, uh, replace it with the other model. And now I have a model that has a surface resolution with the correct composition, yeah? And all those things in a way are correctly um, uh, articulated, yeah? So um, for me, that, that aspect, I'm, I'm not dismissing in a way interpolation. I, I find it actually amazing. It's just that maybe as uh, the only step, maybe I'm not that interested in, I don't know why. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, from, that, uh, from that perspective of, it's actually learning the representation of the data. And then once you do that, you have a lot of other options now suddenly, yeah? You can project within that latent space, a certain composition and force in a way that latent space to, uh, to be manipulated now, according to that. You can uh, project a sort of uh, a query, like a text-based query to alter in a way that. So I think there are a lot of, a lot of benefits to that kind of interpolation that you can, can um, create. I want maybe, one. <laughs> maybe I could just, just pick up on that. I mean, I, I, so I just, so, I mean, I, I find this, the, the uh, Demis Osiris' thoughts kind of interesting, but I think they're limited for two reasons. One is to say, if you take, um, if you take the Costas point of view, everything is interpolation in some sense because it's already out there, right? So, so what do you, how can you make that distinction between... Uh, Depends things? the level. Yeah, it depends on the level, I guess. Uh, yeah. The second thing is that, that his third type, which he calls, uh, you know, I don't know what the term invention. is, but it, what's it? The, invention. Invention. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that always, I mean, just going back to that kind of question about federated learning and things, which I think is really the most interesting that came out of discussion today in some ways. It's always coming out of something. There's no such thing as pure invention. No, it's, that's what the, you know, Gary, whatever else, it was all based on all these different sort of things. We might perceive it as invention. But it, it can't come from nowhere. It has to come out of a, a series of other steps. Yeah, definitely. Um, but I think it's it's a matter of uh, of scale. Yeah. So, for example, and uh, that's why I think also when we talk about not scale level, sorry, um, that's when we talk about creativity. It's like uh, at what level are we referring to? 
for example, uh, an office uh, would be insane in a way for an office to constantly reinvent the wheel every single day. So an office uh, more likely is going to uh, engage in a, a interpretive kind of uh, idea of creativity in a way because they have to mature somehow their repertoire yeah? and by iterating and uh, almost like copying themselves again and again and again they are able to uh, to develop actually those ideas yeah so um yeah sometimes like also interpretive creativity if we call it that is not the bad thing it doesn't have to be a bad thing because there is a um there is a lot of uh, uh meaning to that kind of iterative process you know and it could be quite rich once you have a large repertoire, which is quite diverse internally. So I think uh, there's already a lot of, I think, uh, coming out of that. And I'm, I'm really, with, I mean, we're working with Rafik at the, at the, Rafik at the moment on this internally, but I also would, would invite you to, uh, uh, once you set up your, your startup company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so interpolative like, is the same. Like, and I think this is the, the amazing thing, like, uh, once you have a model that learned the representation, you can really like play with with the weight in a way of of the language that you have, yeah, of the repertoire that you have. And uh, we have in Deep Blah, we have a few uh, a few networks that are doing that. Like you can say, I want this this feature in a way to be uh, uh, toned down a bit, and this one has to be more uh, more enhanced or something. So you, you have that kind of live model. That you can now play with that uh, with, with that uh, stylistic in a way, and then uh, the idea is that you know that's what I think uh, absolutely. And, and I mean, you, you know, my passion at the moment is um, the metaverse and that huge takeoff and the amount of design which we need to generate and the, and also you think about the amount of regeneration. I mean, recreating designs and mutating mm -hmm. designs. I mean, they're not going to last for fifty years. These building or hundred. So so I think in that context. I think we should talk. I mean, what what you have there as 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 you know, in rationalized and directed creativity machine for 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 design, which we need to, we need that because we are already. Um, I mean, the metaverse is literally exploding. I mean, in terms of work for all of us, and and we won't be able to generate it. And and then also once you have and the feedback the post occupancy in inverted commas and feedback uh, is going to be a data avalanche yeah so definitely. Let's, I mean, let's, that's why... let's gear let's gear up let's gear up i think i think that's that's why i personally am uh, i'm trying to to look ahead in a way and whatever decision whatever moves i'm making when it comes to the way that i'm designing the network has to be flexible enough so that in the future yeah, when those uh, those things come in the already data have the be substituted yeah yeah i can yeah. easily just plug in in a way those things you know yeah. because otherwise if, if you don't keep in mind those uh developments in a way uh, you're going to be obsolete in like two three years probably <laughs> yeah. I, I, did, I just want to say one quick comment. I'm going to invite An Angelica Ponce in a second. She's from Brazil and she has a quick question. But I just want to say, I was, I was at a conference last week in, in Palm Springs and uh, uh, there was a discussion about the metaverse. And the metaverse in some ways is, was, was pointed out then is essentially what we've had already. It's just changed because of the, the range of possibilities. But to my mind, the really interesting possibility of the metaverse or, or whatever we call it anyway, is as a way of generating and testing design, not as a representation of our own world. So I think that Daniel's, your own research into your doctoral research, as I understand it, about how do you test out things, that's the real potential of this other domain. So it becomes like a digital twin where we use these AI as an engine to try and uh, test out solutions and produce things and eventually to design things. That, that's essentially what I think my news are heading towards in the in the end in her, in her DDES research. Do you want to maybe comment? Definitely, on definitely. I mean, um... I think that's how a big tech is able to um, to improve their uh, their products extremely uh, fast. Yeah, so every single day there are maybe ten thousand, if not more, uh, versions of uh, of a software out there. You know, and we all interact with them without even knowing. Yeah, so I think also in metaverse the same thing will be uh, uh, amazing in a way for us our, as architects. We can easily in a way test ideas out, and also uh, uh, agent-based parametric semiology. You know, it's the same question, like how you collect the data and how people are interacting in the space. Uh, there are a lot of privacy issues when it comes to uh, physical spaces. 
So in metaverse, it's a completely different discussion then. And probably that can feed into uh, to the actual, um, how we design the, the spaces, you know? Yeah, you know yeah absolutely. Saying? Yeah, we, obviously that research group is already shifting into the metaverse. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I saw the the, uh, the metaverse project. Uh, it was all over the scene, uh, all over. Yeah, there's much more in the pipeline. Nice. So, um, uh, Angelica, would you like to ask your question? Hi. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Daniel, for bringing her work. It's really amazing. But I was just wondering uh, up to which extent the innovation is really uh, innovative as it is biased by the office database. How can you start like really reinventing yourself uh, if you're using uh, the office database? I mean, how do you expand that and you move from that and think out of the box uh, solutions can come, come up? So I think um, that's, that's why uh, the, the, the system is set up the way that it's set up. And that's why personally, I believe it's most, most, most of the time it's about the architecture of things, yeah? So uh, if you have an architecture that is very constraining, then of course you're going to interpolate and you're just going to repeat the same kind of style, yeah? Um, but the way that is set up right now, it's based on this kind of idea of open system, yeah? So um, open process, sorry, not open system, uh, open process where it's not that you're only designing with narrow networks, yeah? We have a, a lot of other kind of processes that we engage in, uh, uh, in, in office when we design something. And then those kind of uh, modes, get uh, fed into the network, yeah? So in that way, yes, network has, in a way, let's say, um, a sort of aesthetic and a sort of uh, design that it's outputting, but we as designers, we also can continuously innovate and bring in a way that, that innovation into the network, yeah? So it's not just one way street in a way, yeah? So um, for me, that's, that's the, the big part of why I'm uh, setting up the network the way I set it up so that you can easily, in a way, have access. You can have different points of access. You have different degrees of agency. Uh, let's say for this project, I wanna have a low degree of agency. I just wanna have the network outputting for me this kind of interpolations, trying to understand this and this and that. And then I'm going to take those and I'm going to create a project. Or in other instances, the network should be able to look at perhaps like models that I already developed and then somehow augment those or further develop them. Yeah? So for me, it's, it's that, that aspect, that's how you ensure that actually you are keep on inventing, keep on growing, and you're not just reiterating, you know, in the past, yeah? Uh, although even that aspect is not bad, like, like we were just discussing, yeah? Sometimes, you know, in an architectural office, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every single day. Uh, sometimes you have to revisit, you know, ideas and actually work them uh, better and better and better, yeah? So you kind of you train the model first with the office database? And then you start inputting different uh, data and yeah. So the, the initial yeah the, uh, at the beginning you start with the, the, the historical let's say project that are already built or uh, competitions. Um, you use that information to start the network, but once you have that base and you start to interact, then you start to add keep on adding away the uh, the data that is created now through the interaction. You know. Okay. Thank you. So in that so way, it... in that way, then uh, you as a designer, you're also like growing you're getting augmented in a way but in the same way in the same time also the network uh, gets to be augmented by your input or new ideas that you're bringing yeah so uh, in the future like uh, let's say imagine each office will have their own model that can train with their uh, projects and then starting putting things and and, and designing with that like a, 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 an auxiliary mechanism for creation perhaps uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that all the offices are willing to to put in the effort for that. Yeah, no, not now. But I think, like in the far away future, maybe that's the way you're gonna work. I yeah, think probably. it's amazing, very exciting. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I just oh, maybe I should. Throw, maybe we're already doing that, Angelica. Maybe we're, because we're all. In some ways, I mean, Gary's producing more Gary kind of thing anyway, with or without AI. You know, we, we, we become like these chess pieces, as I was going to say. We, we kind of these, we, we're constrained by certain things. We develop certain habits and so on. It, you know, it's, uh, I just want to throw out another question to, to Daniel. But, you know, maybe what we've, what we've discussed today, the key thing is to say that actually 
the, the reinventing the wheel is, is actually a, a kind of a bit of a misnomer because it implies suddenly, aha, wow, the wheel. But actually what we're talking about is this kind of federated learning whereby the wheel is, is a result of a whole process of previous steps. And, and you know, it's not as if we ever do that, you know, we just, it's, it, it's, it's going on the background and suddenly you recognize, oh, maybe that's a wheel. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, could be, <laughs> could be. Um, we've got a couple of we we've got some questions in the uh, in the chat which I just noticed. Um, uh, um, yeah, uh, so there's a question from Janat Sartz. I haven't even had a chance to read it yet, um, but let me just put it here. Uh, building bylaws, i.e., development control regulations in poor states like India. Uh, can AI help in cost, in creating cost-efficient residential buildings? Also, how can such tech help in affordable buildings? Can the entire approvals and design process be fully automated and made super fast and easy for any developer to directly buy? Um, I'm not quite sure if you got that question. It's in the chat. Uh, anyway. Yes, but um, personally, I don't like this kind of top-down, you know, I kind of uh, approaches to things. So, um... Um, yeah, it might be that uh, they they can be solved, but uh, very often, like the solution, is not um, not what we think. Like this kind of top down. Very often, it's uh, simply uh, you have a startup that tries to take on one tiny bit of of that uh, whole bureaucracy in a way of um, building industry, and suddenly in a way that has ripple effects in a way, and that starts to revolutionize things. Yeah. So I'm uh, I think there there is a startup that is uh, looking at. Um, automatically looking at your flow plans to make sure that you are uh, um, in compliance in a way with a, with a building code or something. Yeah? And those kind of things are very, you might say they're boring AIs for me, and that's not interesting. Um, but um, those, those ha could have like huge effects. Yeah? And I think uh, those, uh, if you bring them uh, early on in the design process, it's going to, to save a lot. Yeah? I think what's happening, uh, especially when it comes to this kind of um, affordable, probably usually what's happening is uh, you design something and then you try to make it affordable or something like that, which I think uh, you should start the other way around probably. Yeah? You should start with certain sort of models that already at the beginning that can give you an idea of if this is moving in the correct direction or not. Yeah? Uh, I think a similar discussion is also about environmental. And here, like, I, I don't wanna like create the impression that I'm pushing, uh, let's say, I'm more interested in design. Yeah, let's make it clear. I'm more interested in design. So I'm interested in white um, ideas, designs that are actually very interesting. Yeah, in the end, they have a sort of a certain architectural quality. Um, but you can bring in a way, for example, environmental uh, uh, simulation analysis or this kind of tools early on before you even start to, to have the design ready. And what's happening very often is that this kind of calculation, this kind of like, I'm uh, within budget, I'm not within budget. They, uh, you tend to apply those kind of uh, analysis after the design is already 80% there, you know? And then it's very hard in a way to, to go back and redo everything. So I think if you, if you have a process that is a bit more integrated and you have like uh, all these uh, aspects of design aesthetics, what you're interested in, uh, you know, uh, the quality of design that you're interested in, and then also bring the other aspects, and perhaps have this kind of ability to really like move some sliders to say, okay, I want to have design a bit overpowering, you know, I, this kind of like uh, very pragmatic, you know, I need, you know, and try to, to find that kind of balance where you still have a good design, but in the same time, you also have affordability or something. Uh, but for sure, for sure, you, you can, you can um, use AI there. But for me, it will always be, you know, um, a measure for me for AI would be um, you can you can look at uh, thousands and thousands on, of floor plans how to create maybe a floor plan that it's uh, going to result in something more affordable. But if your AI is just outputting the same kind of conventional floor plan that we all know, for me I'm always asking, well, why do you need AI for that? You know, you don't need AI for that. I would expect in a way if you use that AI to suddenly come up with some very interesting novel solutions that probably uh, uh, as humans, we will not be able to, uh, to generate something like that, yeah? So to look at like thousands, millions of floor plans and then come up with a floor plan solution that it's actually really affordable, um, that will be interesting, yeah? I mean, 
problems are very amenable to all sorts of optimization process, not necessarily a AI. Yeah. One, I mean, X school are obviously doing that because th these problems are relatively simple because you have a generic set of units and you have some criteria of distance and uh, daylight, etc. And then you have uh, you, you maximize um, s certain parameters within the you know site and so on. So I think that yeah, definitely, it's not necessarily obviously it's very much far away from what you're trying to do, Daniel. And, but it, you know, there are not only AIs that you know there have been these kind of layout algorithms for many years, even in the 19. Uh, they, they, I come across them already in the in the, in the mid 80s. Yeah, I agree. But you know, AI can do also a lot by by having a very solid uh, data set uh, and and searching through through. And basically, it's it's the, the for the client would be the the trust issue is you know you can trust that this is probably the uh, the best solution within this uh, criteria set which you can't trust if an architect comes back after a week and have scribbled a few options maybe five options so so that's and also on the side of the planners i mean i think what you mentioned is very interesting uh, that a system like that would be you know it's like a diagnosis system of you know for, for in medicine that they become more robust and reliable, and also you can you can you can roll them out and scale them out where where you, where you, where you have inexperienced planners who can use those tools to to check. And so but it's not like... it's a different it's a different world. I mean that's it's not a mean world. It's a it's a world you know of, of automation, which is which is important and productivity enhancing and rationality enhancing. But it's obviously not your world, then. Yeah, and usually for us, like as architects, we always have this kind of super long, in a way, uh, feedback loops, like uh, mm. you design and until the building is built to actually understand how people mm. are using it and how the building is used and so on. It's a very long, in a way, feedback loop. Yeah, but with, with this kind of technologies, be them like uh, simulations, like agent-based simulations or AI predictions, yeah, you can perhaps already have at the very beginning, in a way, an understanding of uh, how that design solution actually um, uh, works out, yeah, and I think that's that's going to be something for uh, developers and other uh, clients. You know, I uh, that's going to be a game changer for them, yeah. And I think for architects actually, it's going to be a a, a painful thing, yeah, because uh, architects will have to prove in a way that their buildings are actually wor are working. Uh, I'm not sure, Patrick. Uh, uh, there is there is a platform in UK, I believe, Kobe or something like that, where um, you have to prove or you you don't get a certain fee until uh, uh, you can prove that the building actually it's used the way that you design or something like that i don't remember if it's really like that but um well, I, I think not, i'm not gonna come across that but maybe maybe we're okay. working in china more than anywhere else okay so um yeah i think it's it's already like um, um happening some uh, that kind of tendency i think uh it's it's there um and I think architects uh, soon will have to prove, in a way, that their buildings yeah, are really working. We, you know? Yeah, they have to be ever more evidence-based and, and rational. And, and that's the professionalism. The degree of professionalism you have to at least limit. Yeah. The boxes and you have to tick, uh, they're ramping up all the time. I suspect it's for, uh, you know, it makes sense, but it doesn't make it easier to, to stay creative. Yeah. So maybe we should uh, think about uh, wrapping up. It's been a fantastic <laughs> session. Really, really fantastic, Daniel. I mean, such really tremendous. I mean, I wanted to kind of throw a, full, a, a thought out there as we kind of wrap things up. And that is to say, I mean, I think to my mind, what was interesting, what, there's a lot of interesting things, but one of the most interesting things was the way in which you started picking up on the federated learning aspect, which of course was part of Blaze's discussion. And it struck me that first of all, that what we're doing now, at, which actually is kind of operating in the metaverse, actually, though, is a form of, of, of federated learning. 
I mean, I had this concept of the global brain, but actually what this platform affords, it kind of allows for a much faster interaction and, and, and a much faster learning process because everybody comes together on that same platform. And I think we st yet to develop a, a theory of this platform and why it's so effective, but it seems to me today we've got evidence of that. We are learning um, it, it, from each other and that we only ever learn from each other. And I also thought the other aspect that came out was interesting was the, the idea that federated learning um, also implies learning from AI. We are like, as in again, we are training it, but we're also being trained by it and, and so on. So that it's a lot of, it's an incredibly rich bedrock of ideas that we, we came up today. Um, so I want to just thank Daniel for, for this. I mean, it's, it's always great to, I mean, the, the reflexiveness, which reflexivity, which we approach the question of AI is really super uh, rich from a theoretical perspective. And I, wonderful, wonderful. Um, and I also want to thank those uh, who, who asked questions today uh, to Patrick and Marina and so on, uh, and, and uh, Matt, and it's really great questions. Um, I also want to thank those behind the team behind this, um, uh, who've been contributing to it. It, 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 it. There is a support team that's doing all this. Thank you, Ayana, thank you everyone else. Um, and uh, just to say that, so next week we have Susan Schneider uh, joining us, who's also from FAU. It seems that FAU is turning into some kind of hot space of, of, of AI, neuroscience and whatever else. Yeah. And By the way, we, we just got a, a big server. So Matt, regarding your question with, uh, connecting networks hopefully we are going to have some results there with that you know Let's we, we just it. got we just got a big server so ai server so yeah <laughs> and, and and you just got a new director as well right you can't see that okay all right okay uh, <laughs> okay um all right so thank you so much and um Let's uh, let's 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 move forward. And, and, and next week we look forward to to, to to Susan Schneider's session on artificial you, uh, based on her book. If you want to order a copy in advance, um, fabulous session. It's going to be uploaded to our uh, YouTube um, library along with every other session. Uh, if anybody wants to uh, come and join us um, and, and as a team, um, please send an email to info.digitalfutures.world. Uh, we are busy recruiting for the summer, but we'll have a big event happening um, and uh, hopefully lots of AI. So uh, astonishing, Daniel, fantastic session, really grateful, um, very illuminating. Um, and uh, thank you so much. And thank you to all those else, other people who were part of the process today. It's been great. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, good stuff.